good. Welcome to the June 12th, 2019 Hudson Planning Board. We'll call this meeting to order at 7.08. Um, Mr. Vanderveen, will you lead us in the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Collins, please uh, call the roll. Here. Mr. Ulrey. Here. Mr. Brackett is excused. Mr. Dumont. Here. Mr. Vanderveen. Here. Mr. Veloso. Here. Selectman McGrath. Present. And Selectman Petro is excused. Uh, Tom Planner, Brian Groff is in attendance. Here. Here. Both. Thank you. Okay. All right. So some, Selectman McGrath will be seated for Selectman Kutu. And I'll see, Mr. Veloso will be seated for Mr. Brackett. Okay, well, we'll deal with the meeting minutes later. So, we're going to start off with uh, first order of business is the 161 Low Road, two lot subdivision, and Friar Court's site plan. Uh, so, these applications are ready for acceptance? Yes, um, the application is complete and ready to be accepted. Um, the applicant uh, is working with town staff and the, our consulting engineer to refine some detail of the, of the plan, um, but it is uh, ready for acceptance. Okay. Anyone want to make a motion to accept? Motion. Made by Mr. Ellery. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Dumont. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Okay. So now, we're going to open the public hearing. Well, so we have the, that's the applicant's testimony. Yep. So at this point, we'll have the applicant provide their testimony. Mr. Chairman? Yep. Are we treating this as two separate activities, or can we combine the two of them since it's essentially the same thing? We can talk about them both together. Yeah. Thank you. Talk about them Yes, thank you. I, I uh, appreciate that question. Well, my name is Thomas J. Leonard, and I'm here in behalf of the applicant, um, and I, representing Dakota Partners, I have uh, with me Mr. Mark Pilot, who is the uh, vice president at uh, Dakota Partners. I also have Carl Dubay, Jason Plourd, and Jesse Thompson. Uh, Jason is the traffic engineer. Carl is the PE, uh, Jason is the traffic engineer, and Jesse Thompson is the architect. So we're here. I, I think we're going to be able to answer pretty much any question you may have. But my first question was exactly the one raised by Mr. Ulery. Um, did the motion accept for jurisdiction both the subdivision and the site plan? I think I understood that, but I just want to make clear. for 161 low road map 209 law one. Okay. It was already. I, I know, but you didn't say it. Ah. All right, so we are, so I appreciate that because I think they, uh, they do both go together here and it makes sense to uh, discuss them. So I'll, I'll proceed on that basis. Um, I should apologize right in advance here about using this clicker because I'm sure I won't get it right. But. <laughs> So first off, let me uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, discuss this whole plan with you today. Um, Carl DeBay and, and the rest of the team, Mark, uh, Jason, and Jesse have done an awful lot of work since we last uh, met. Uh, I think you should have um, a full set of plans, both for the subdivision and for the site plan. You should have a full set of architecturals. We, we have those uh, available for the screen. You should also have some traffic engin uh, engineering inf uh, information from Jason Plude at uh, BHB. And then there is a, uh, a letter on the school impacts and the school children from Marc Fougere. I think that's in your packet. Uh, and then there is uh, some other uh, miscellaneous information. There's some new information from the manager of the site uh, once it 
once it gets constructed, we will have it managed by a group, and there's some information in there. Uh, but we'll, we'll kind of go through this uh, step by step. As you know, the proposal is for a subdivision. The, the overall tract of land at 161 Lowell Road is a large tract uh, that has been vacant for a long, long time, the old friary. And uh, this particular proposal is really just to sub subdivide uh, about 11, 11 and a half acres in the front, the B zone. And the sole purpose of it is for this one development of a multifamily rental workforce housing project. And so that's what we're here for today, the subdivision and then the site plan. The site plan, of course, is just that uh, smaller lot. I'll refer to it as the Dakota lot. Um, but it's the front portion, the B zone area. Uh, the proposal is for two buildings, uh, 81 total units. They will be built in phases, one building at a time. Uh, the reason for that is primarily financing. It will be multifamily building, three-story buildings, and we're going to hear a lot from uh, Jesse Thompson on the nature of those buildings. The, the last time we spoke, uh, there were a number of questions about the design and some of the specifics of the building, and, and we will specifically address all of those questions. Uh, the project is a workforce housing. Uh, there were some questions on uh, exactly what that meant. Uh, essentially, uh, we can give you some detail on that, but basically the project will be half or it's, it's an odd number, so it won't be exactly half, but uh, approximately half one bedroom, half two bedroom. 25% of the units will be market rate, and 75% and are what we call income restricted. Uh, what that really means is that um, they will be qualified as workforce rental housing, uh, and there is a, uh, there's a, a, a program that we follow for uh, qualifying individuals who will, uh, families who will uh, uh, be, a, for whom those units will be available. And we'll talk some more about that. Um, but it's, it's roughly 25% market, 75% uh, workforce housing. Um, the summary of this, the, the staff report was, uh, there's been a lot of work done on this and I think this uh, board knows that. Um, Brian Growth, uh, the, the engineering office, the fire, the police, there's been a lot of work done. I think his uh, summary is pretty good uh, in, in setting all of that out. No real need for me to go through that, but let me simply say that we're happy to answer questions on the process. Um, we're pleased with how we, where we are now, uh, and we think we've addressed the concerns that have been raised by staff and the different uh, professionals uh, that are representing the town. The, the complex, um, one of the questions at the design review was uh, some of the more, some more detail on how it actually gets operated. So if I, I'll take a minute and do that. And I'd like to refer to um, a letter from, is it Mahoney? That's the one I left over there. But there is a management letter, yeah. Thank you, Mark. So I think you should have uh, a letter in your file from Maloney Properties Applicant Screening is the title of the letter. And that gives you a pretty good idea of the process. What happens here is once these get built, um, because of the financing that this company will get through New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, there are going to be restrictions and we will have a commitment to certain work, workforce type units and the process requires that families and individuals must be qualified in order to fit into those units or to, in order to rent those units. This uh, summary that we provided is basically what the management company will do to qualify the individuals and you see that there's a, a very specific screening process. There's a, a screening for criminal history, there's screening for uh, financial, there's citizenship review, 
there's uh, sex offender registration status, all of those kinds of things that you would hope get done uh, actually do get done. This is a professional group. This is all they do is manage these kinds of properties. And that's what, uh, that's what will happen at this site. There will be, um, uh, and as people get qualified, we actually have to re-qualify each, uh, each time there's a new rental. So um, it's a very specific program. The program, our present plan is, as I say, to have approximately 25% market rate, which uh, uh, is, is exactly what you would expect. And then of the remaining 75%, most of them will be the statutory formula for workforce housing, and that is um, affordable, which generally affordable means 30% uh, of the income. So long as the rent plus utilities is 30% or less, that's considered affordable. So of these 75% income restricted, uh, 18 of those units, or um, a little like 30, 35% of the total, will be at that number. They will be 60% of the AMI. AMI is just the average uh, income, family income, and 60% is New Hampshire's definition of workforce housing, and, and uh, so that's where we get that number. The remaining 17 units will be available to individuals and families with either 50% or 30%. So generally speaking, those are the restrictions on income. Um, it will be defined as a workforce housing project. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, architecturals in a minute. One of the things that uh, we need to address our waivers, and I'm not sure how, uh, Mr. Chairman, how would you like, would you like us to give us some information on those specific waivers at this time? Is that? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> as I say, the, the staff and, and uh, e each of the teams, if you will, have worked hard to accomplish uh, this plan. There's been a lot of changes along the way to give you a, a sense of some of those changes. Well, before I get to that, we, we need three waivers, and they have been uh, requested. Uh, you should have those in your packet as well. Essentially what the waivers are is one is about parking, and we've, we talked about that at design review, and the request is that we be permitted to have 1.5 spaces for phase one, uh, we, and we'll talk uh, more specifically in a minute, but uh, there is an, a space that has been designated for additional parking should it be needed. We can, we can meet the requirement of two. Uh, it's just with our experience, uh, and they run, you know, more than 12 different projects similar to this. Their experience is because of the mix of housing, in other words, because of the mix of the units, one bedroom and two bedroom, the expectation is that 1.5 spaces uh, will be sufficient. Uh, they are going to be in this, in the, uh, they meaning Dakota Properties, will be in this for the long run. They own it, they manage it, they're going to want enough parking, they feel confident with the 1.5 based on their experience, but should it become a problem, we will have area designated for expansion of that, and we're uh, open to and, and uh, willing to review things for phase two, so that uh, it's just a, for the first year, basically, we would try the 1.5, um, and, and uh, if necessary, we'd go to 2.0 uh, later on. Um, I think it's a reasonable request under the rules, the waiver re rules. Basically, we need to show that it's unnecessary to, to meet the, uh, the specific requirement, uh, but that by waiving it, there's no real disadvantage to the town. Uh, we don't violate the intentions and the purposes of the, uh, of the ordinance, um, and it's really uh, a benefit. Uh, and, and I think the benefits are obvious. Um, you heard early on in the discussions of design review that many of the neighbors would like to see as many trees over in that area in particular. Uh, as many trees remain as possible. That's, that's one of the goals. Obviously, less pavement, more trees is a, is a fair goal. Um, so that's the basis of the parking request. It's really, uh, 
it's a waiver in the sense that we're asking to go to 1.5, but if necessary, we can go to 2.0. We just like to have a year to see if it works first. Uh, we certainly want to have enough parking in all regards. Uh, the other waiver uh, relates to uh, there is a plan requirement that says that uh, we need to show details of all surrounding properties for the entire tract of land. And of course, this tract is uh, over 80 acres. Uh, we are only involved with the front portion. It becomes unreasonable and unnecessary to do that. There's no real reason to show you what's happening over a thousand feet from this site. Uh, so the main, that is the request to uh, not be obligated to present all of the information that relates to the back 77 acres. Um, we can certainly give you answers on things and we can uh, address the concerns of the abutters, but for example, we don't need to show all of the topo back there, all of the uh, uh, easements, etc., because they're just not relevant to this, uh, this plan. Uh, that of course would, you will have that information should that land ever become developed, but at this point in time, it's, there's nothing uh, being proposed. Um, and then the, the last waiver is uh, a little bit of an unusual one, and that relates to uh, the Friars Drive. You may remember that um, we are extending, the proposal is to extend Friars Drive, and you can see it here in the site plan uh, going off to the left from the bottom of the page to the upper left. And that's an existing road. It's a private road. Uh, we are proposing at the request of the engineering office, we are proposing to, did I do that? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we are proposing to reconstruct that. Um, and uh, Elvis Dima has, looked, has worked carefully with our uh, team and they have come up with a plan. The plan calls for essentially a 24-foot uh, road instead of a normally, uh, I think it's 32 feet, um, although I understand that the planning board has changed the regulations and I'm not sure if that's actually in effect now. But in any event, what's going on is the, it doesn't need to be as, as full scale as a full road, especially in the early stages here. It will be proposed as a private connection for phase one, and it is available for a public connection uh, later on at phase two, uh, should the planning board decide that's appropriate. The reason for the uh, requested waiver is that there's no really reason to go beyond that 24 feet uh, with the present purposes, uh, but we are and we will have available a 50-foot uh, right-of-way easement so that uh, the future is planned for. We've talked about that in the uh, design phase discussion of this and we continue to offer that to the town. So um, that's the reason for that last waiver. Uh, I think, well, so let me, with that in mind, I, one thing we would love to accomplish here tonight, and I know that uh, we've got some more work to do, and, and uh, Brian Groth has, has expressed that. Uh, I think most of the work relates to traffic, so to the extent we can kind of chip away at some of these outside issues, this being, the waivers being one, I very much appreciate that. So, I think the next thing I'd like to do is kind of go back a little bit to our earlier meetings. We, by the way, I, I think uh, everybody knows there was, uh, and it was mentioned in the summary, we did uh, go to the Conservation Commission, we did go to the Zoning Board, and we did get our special exception to do that road work that I just described, that being Friars Drive. So that is all in order. Um, I think, uh, yes. Some of the other things that happened along the way, um, we worked hard with the uh, police and fire. You'll see in the, in the set of plans, that's good. So this is, shows you the graphics of the access that was discussed, um, and I, I, the, the fire department is happy with things. I can also tell you that at the top of the page, you see that building, it actually moved uh, a, a little bit to, account, to accommodate some of the concerns of the, of the chief. So, 
Um, we worked hard to answer those questions. I think we have answered them all as far as uh, everybody is concerned. Um, you can also see that, uh, well, some of the other things that we continue to offer and at the request of the staff is, a, again, going back to the, uh, going back to sheet eight, sheet eight. Can you do that? That's the uh, main site plan. Uh, one more. No, keep going. Let's see, that must be uh, that is sheet six. I think that one there is uh, sheet five. So if you go three more in the other direction, there you go. So you can see along the frontage there that um, we continue to have uh, set the buildings back an additional 10 feet to make sure that the frontage along Lowell Road, should there, should there be a need in the future, uh, we've accommodated that a potential need. We've also uh, made the right-of-way, as I said, the right-of-way for Friar Drive is 50 feet. And we've uh, widened the whole access um, intersection. At, that is on uh, page nine. It, it shows it. Yeah. It's actually called sheet nine of 33. So, so you can see generally the, uh, the geometry of things on, on that plan, too. Uh, just. Uh, to also point out, I mentioned to you that uh, we had it designated a certain area for additional parking spaces. You can see on that same sheet in the upper right portion of it, uh, there is an area that's, uh, that's where the additional parking is uh, should it become needed. So the other thing that we have done is we've tried to address the uh, concerns of the planning board that were uh, expressed at the design meeting. And, and really, that's the main thing uh, that we have some more presentation to you on here today. We've, we've talked about the parking. Uh, the, by the way, the parking spaces are all 10 by 20. This, this board asked for that, uh, and we made that change. Uh, from nine, 9 by 18 to 10 by 20. Uh, we talked about the requested waiver for the 1.5 over the 2, uh, but we have added the extra area should we need the 2. Um, there is a letter in your file about uh, school impacts. I think there was a specific question about school impacts. The short story on that is uh, uh, Mr. Mark Fougere did a, uh, uh, an analysis for us. He determined, so the town, as I know you know, has uh, impact studies and, and uh, those studies included school impacts. We do pay a school impact fee based on um, Bruce Mayberry's studies. Using the information from that study and the uh, estimated school children based upon the town's analysis at the time of that study, uh, Mark Fougere estimated how many children would be in this program uh, or in this complex. It's consistent with his experience in other programs. Um, and he, after estimating those, I believe the number was a total of 15 children. And it's, of course, over the different grades. Uh, but he also sat down with the superintendent of schools and talked to the talk to him about capacities in the school, and it's uh, set out in his letter, but there's plenty of capacity. There's really no, no question at all that there's ample capacity, even if it were twice as many kids. So um, the bottom line is that the schools have a lot of capacity. They've actually lost uh, enrollment over the past five or six years. So Mr. Fougere's letter is in your packet. 
Um, there were some questions about snow storage. Uh, you'll see on the plan there are areas designated and there is a note uh, in the, on the plan as well that says that should the uh, snow storage be insufficient, it, it will get carted off site in accordance with New Hampshire DES rules. There's also a, a note as to how the snow will be managed according to best practices and there's a, a, a best practices program that comes out of UNH and um, uh, you'll see a note on the plan in that regard. Um, so I think the, the primary thing, and it's probably a, a pregnant silence here, that I haven't talked about traffic at all because that was the really the big issue, uh, the big issue uh, both from the standpoint of the staff, big issue from the standpoint of the public, and I think the planning board as well. So um, we're prepared to uh, talk a little bit in detail on that. And then also I, I want to, uh, actually before I do the, uh, before we talk about traffic, I also, I forgot to do the uh, architectural, and I know there were a number of questions about the architectural. What, what are the buildings going to look like? What are the um, units going to look like? And Jesse Thompson is here, and he is, uh, he can certainly give you a lot of the detail. We're very proud of the, of the design of this building. It's, uh, um, well, I'm going to let him uh, describe it. So what I'd like to do is, if you don't mind, if you can go to the end of the uh, section, you're going to see, uh, see building pictures and then plans. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So this, Jesse Thompson is an architect from Portland, Maine, and he's, uh, he can get, answer all the questions you want about this. Yeah, so uh, Jesse Thompson, Portland, Maine, registered New Hampshire architect. Uh, went to high school in Wilton, so I'm close to where I spent some time in my life. Um, <clears throat> so we, um, we're excited on this project because We've been working with Dakota on several projects, and what we like most of all is they build high-quality buildings, and uh, they are in it for the long haul. They aren't uh, that, that these buildings are built to last, and I think that's partly why they've been asking us to work with them. Um, it's always tricky to build apartment buildings in uh, in neighborhoods where you may not be in the middle of a downtown. So we've done several things uh, with this design, and I want to talk a little bit about it. Of, of what we've done to um, try to make some aspects of it and how it, it fits in. Um, actually, is the site plan available? Could we flip back to the green site plan? Ooh, uh, the one on the cover, actually. Thank you. So one thing that we did from the very first move was that we knew these buildings, um, what we did is we've oriented this phase one to make sure that the narrow end of the building faces the street. And that's so that the narrow end of the building, which is um, in the width of about 24 and 36 feet, is more in the proportion of a width of homes than it is of the length of the building. So that as you're moving up and down Lowell Road, you'll see the narrow edge of the building. You won't see the broad face of the building. We've also, we're planting a line of trees along that we hope will work like a traditional New England street where you have the big street trees moving along the street that will also um, screen the building from the street. Um, and we've also taken this building and we've separated it into three sections. So they're all joined, but each individual section so that the building gets small, is broken down into three smaller sections. Um, and it doesn't appear as one long mass of a building. And that was very intentional to try to uh, do our best to fit into the, the uh, village context, the New England village context. So if you go back to the architectural images, um, I think it's the other file, but or maybe it's the end. There we go. The other piece that we're doing here is that um, Dakota is very interested in this and the state of New Hampshire is very interested in it and it, that we are trying to do the highest quality building we can and part of that has been that we are building this building to um, passive house principles, which is sort of a funny name, but it's that um, the state of New Hampshire has, is asking folks who work with this program to make sure that uh, folks who live here have very warm and comfortable homes, the buildings are affordable to run, and that the state of New Hampshire's money is very well invested over time. So what we we're doing, and it's a fairly amazing system that if you, we have a fresh air system inside the building 
that brings fresh air into everyone's apartments 24 hours a day. And it also is pulling all of the air out of all the bathrooms and the kitchens 24 hours of the day. So that one, because we have fresh air in the building, we can build the building enclosure incredibly carefully and we can seal up every gap and crack in it so the wind doesn't blow through, the heat doesn't leave, uh, because we know that everyone inside is safe. And then we can use triple glazed windows and a little bit of extra insulation. We can get these buildings to use almost no heat all winter long. And it's, a, it's fairly astounding. We've done several buildings like this and um, you know, we're, we're seeing costs uh, for folks to live here of you know, $50 a month for everything included. And that's for the life of the building. So these buildings are working really, really well for folks whose incomes aren't very high. They're all working. These are, you know, doc these are nurses, firefighters, police, they're, they're workforce. They're folks, you know, with jobs. And these are, um, we know these buildings will be comfortable all year round. Um, and so it's a really excellent form of construction. And the state of New Hampshire is incentivizing this, um, not with actually extra funding. They're just saying, if you do this, um, you might be more likely to win the award. So that's part of the reason why we're here and doing this is um, the better the building, they hope the, the more long lasting it'll be and the better an investment is for the state. So that's the, on the technical side. And if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that your average apartment building is the line to the left. This is sort of your normal New, um, New England apartment building is that red line over to the left. Green over here would be a carbon neutral, you know, zero energy building. And we're not there, but it shows that these buildings that are passive house buildings, which are being built at a very low cost, these are very affordably constructed. They, aren't, they don't have extra money to be built with. We are getting all the way to this sort of um, zone we're all trying to hit of buildings that are doing a, a lot less damage to the environment. So it's, it's a pretty amazing thing that we're doing and all doing it for affordable construction cost. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, this is not the building that we're doing, but this is a building that we have used as a um, sort of spring for design. This is up in Falmouth, Maine, and this is an elderly housing apartment building that is, you know, has a similar narrow edge with a high pitched New England roof. Um, on this building, it was, it was all white clapboards, and there's a nice entrance to it. Uh, but it's, it's a, this building will be a three-story building, not a two-story building, but it's, the design theme is trying to be fairly similar to it. Um, and we just wanted to show this image to show a reference of an actual building that's built uh, that we, we felt like was very handsome and in a New England context. Uh, if you go to the next image, and that's just an interior. Um, so this is what the inside, they get really bright and, and full of light. Um, next image, please. And there's the entrance to this building. Um, we hope to have a similar sort of welcoming entrance. We'll have to meet all accessibility federal standards um, and meet all the, all the regulations that come along with this. Uh, next slide, please. This is the layout of the phase one building. You can see that this is the three sections where there is um, four apartments on the ground floor on the left, there are seven in the middle, and there's five on the right. There's windows in between each section, so as you, if you live here, you'll be able to see out into the, um, into the forest and the landscaping around. The, to the left side is the entrance, where there is a lobby and a mail room and uh, maintenance where they work. And you'll also be able to see through to the forest behind. Uh, but we've tried to take this building and make, make it into three individual sections, so um, it, it won't feel as large. And there's windows at the end of every hallway um, to see out. If you go to the next slide. The upper levels are, are really very similar. It's trying to be an economical building to build, and, um, but there's windows on, you know, every room has windows, all bedrooms and living rooms have windows. Uh, it's, we think it's going to be a really nice place to live. So next slide. These are the apartment layouts. Um, we wanted just to include these just to show folks how you might be able to furnish your apartment. Um, these, uh, you know, one bathroom in the one bedroom in the and uh, we have two bathrooms in the two bedrooms. But they're all um, you know, nice, simple apartments. Um, next slide, please. The materials on this are trying to be to the New England context. So there are um, white uh, cream colored clapboards on the main buildings. We have gabled roofs and dormers like we would have in a traditional building. And then the center is a, a, a cedar shingle of vinyl in the middle to build contrast so it feels like three separate sections. Um, then there's a nice entrance with a broad roof in the middle. So next, please. 
And that's a, a view if you were passing down on, on the street and the narrow end facing the street there. So next slide, please. Um, that's, uh, and that's what we wanted to show folks and show what the building is. So we're I mean, available to answer questions and if anyone has more questions to it. And hold that till the board's question section. So it looks like everybody's good for now. I'll have, a, I'll have a comment. Absolutely. It's Ms. institutional McGrath. looking as opposed to uh, community looking. I don't feel, feel that that fits in with the aesthetics of this community at all. And um, as I said to uh, our planner earlier this evening, we want something that's going to be, as people pass by, this is a major roadway through the town of Hudson, we want them to look at it and have some pride as opposed to some shame. And this doesn't do it. Any other members? I guess that's the only comment at this time. Okay. okay. Well, well, we'll talk some more about the architectural. Um, this is a is a it's a building that has uh, 47 units in it, and it's a complex building. And it's necessary that you have these buildings uh, that are what you're going to suggest is large buildings because of the economics. And we talked a little bit about that at the uh, design review. But essentially, what we need to do is we need to build a building that is uh, high quality um, but efficient and economic. Uh, the reason that the town of Hudson hasn't had a multifamily building in 30 years is because of the economics. And the reason that the state of New Hampshire and Hillsborough County have such difficult times with affordable housing is because the economics are very difficult. And they're especially difficult uh, with rental housing. So. Well, I appreciate your comment. I appreciate that this doesn't look like a small town, um, but that's also why uh, it's located in the business zone. And it's, it's located on Lowell Road. Um, and I think in the context of Lowell Road, it's appropriate and, and I'm hoping that not everybody has uh, uh, the same feeling about it. I actually, I mean, my personal comment wouldn't be the same as yours, but I appreciate your comment, uh, uh, Member McGrath. Uh, but I think as a practical matter, we perhaps can't accomplish what you would like because of the economics and the necessity for a, a larger building. Um, but we can, we can certainly talk about that some more. Um, one of the things that I think we left open the last time, uh, and there has been discussion uh, through the course of the last couple of weeks, has been the, the traffic and the actual intersection. So if you don't mind, uh, can you go back to the very first uh, page, the site plan? It probably shows, shows it as well as anything here. And basically what we have is, uh, an intersection that right now is proposed as a right in, right out. Um, in other words, uh, and, and the access, the reason for the connection to Friar Drive was uh, the planning staff requested a connection to Friar Drive in order to uh, prevent uh, and have as an alternative to a left turn in. And uh, while that isn't necessarily our first choice, we agreed to do that, um, but as we presented it through the de design review stage last go around, uh, we heard a lot of comments uh, from uh, Selectman Kutu, from other members of the public, and from, from members of the, the board here. Um, 
in, in mid-April when we came in the design review, you had a report from Jason Plord, who was with Vanessa Hangen up in Bedford. He's a traffic engineer, and he's here today to talk uh, in some detail uh, should, we, should we need it. Um, after that, and that report basically just assessed this particular access. Um, and uh, after that report, I, we, we spoke with Jason. We asked him to look at a couple of other things based on our conversations uh, at the design review stage. And what he did was he looked at two things. Um, he looked at a left turn in, and he also looked at a deceleration lane coming from the north to take the right in. Um, I'll give you the conclusions, uh, and uh, certainly he can answer more detailed questions. But what, uh, taking the deceleration lane first, he reviewed the standards. So essentially there are standards in different areas of traffic engineering, uh, the AASHTO standards, um, the ITE standards for counting and methodology of counting cars, and then there are other standards also, and, and he can answer that much better than I, but the short story is that in looking at the traffic generated by this site, and in looking at the existing traffic and the existing concerns that there may be on Lowell Road, this project, this complex, has a negligible impact. It really is not a very big project, and it's not an, a big impact on traffic, and it will not have an impact on Lowell Road. Uh, Mr. Plude will, will confirm that and, and tell you how he arrived at that uh, if you had questions on that. But he also looked at the right, the decel lane in the, in, into the project, and by all of the federal and state standards, it is not appropriate to have a deceleration lane in there, and in fact, it works against, it, it has unintended consequences that, uh, uh, so we therefore don't think it's a good idea to have a deceleration lane, um, and we rely on our traffic engineer uh, to, uh, for that conclusion. Uh, with regard to the left turn in, um, Mr. Plude did look at that, um, because this board asked that we look at it. Uh, I think I can probably summarize his uh, conclusion that in his view, all things being equal, if he were to look at this objectively um, without any input uh, from any source other than science and engineering, the best intersection would be one that did have a left turn in. Uh, and the reason for that is there is a middle lane. Uh, the traffic uh, derived from this site is not a big problem. Uh, there are, there's ample time to do it. I, I think Mr. Plude told me that at a peak time, there are probably 10 cars an hour that might access this site, and uh, not all of them would, of course, be taking left turns. So it's just not an impact that would worry him. I think he would also tell you that uh, it's easier to control traffic coming out of the site uh, than it is traffic going into the site and that you'd be better off having a left turn in than forcing people to make their own independent judgment and go down to Nottingham to the, to the plaza and make a U-turn, for instance, um, or things like that. Uh, we are still willing to go with the right turn in, right turn out, if that's what this board decides, um, but we can uh, give you more information on uh, the traffic design and why we arrived uh, where we did. So uh, I think, and you, you have that supplemental information from Mr. Plud uh, in your packet. So that's, uh, I believe it was an April 29th uh, report. In addition to that, Fuss and O'Neill had a couple questions that they raised and he uh, responded to those questions also, so you should have, a, I, I want to say, an early June, maybe June 4th response to the uh, Fuss and O'Neill um, uh, assessment. I think uh, Jason has answered all of the questions that are on the table. He has uh, uh, provided, you know, numbers to support that. Uh, and should, if anyone's uh, interested, I'm, I'm glad to call up here and talk more specifically if you think that you need more detail. Yeah, 
want to bring him up? Yeah. So Jason Plude, he's a traffic engineer with Vanessa Hangen. Or I guess it's actually BHB, right? <laughs> uh, good evening, Jason Plude with Vanessa Hangen Bruslin, BHB. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> um, so what we had done was we had taken a look at the uh, existing conditions along Lowell Road, um, traffic volumes going northbound and southbound along the corridor. The site is on the west side. Uh, right now there is a private driveway not in use hardly ever, if at all. Um, I understand that the original concept was a right in right out. Um, before I even really got involved with the project, the first thing that jumped out at me was you have a single lane in each direction, one going northbound, one going southbound <coughs> on Lowell Road, but you have that center turn lane out there. And the whole intent of a center turn lane is th there's, there's two main purposes of a center turn lane. One is for vehicles that are going either northbound or southbound on Lowell Road to be able to wait in the middle area, so it's a striped median area, where you can wait until there's a gap in the opposing traffic stream to be able to turn in. The other idea of a center turn lane, which I don't think should be applicable to this project, is to accommodate anybody that wants to turn left out, to be able to turn, turn left out and make a two-stage left turn maneuver. So you would cross the southbound traffic stream, wait in the middle, and then be able to then merge in with the northbound traffic stream. I do not recommend that we allow that. I do not think that left turns should be allowed exiting the site at this driveway. So I want to make sure <laughs> all cards are on the table. Now the left's in. Um, let, let, me, let me just kind of give you some numbers, some insight in the traffic engineering world. Um, we are held to different standards. We are held to standards that are put out nationally, locally, and through the state. Um, trip generation, for example. Trip generation is estimated based on the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual. So that's a database of different land uses and the state requires us to use it. Um, nationally, that's a strong recommendation. Site distances, that's uh, put out by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, also known as AASHTO. And then uh, Attorney Leonard had mentioned about um, turn lanes. That's a standard that and guidelines that are supported by New Hampshire DOT and that's put out by the National Cooperative Highway Research Program in CHRP. So we have all these different standards and guidelines that we need to follow. Um, I could come up here and just say there's no impact but I need to have something to support that and that's where these um, traffic documents came into play. So we put together an April 23rd traffic impact assessment that evaluated the impacts of this proposed design that you see in front of you, which is a right in, right out. So based on the trip generation numbers, we have predicted, based on the ITE methodology, eight cars would enter in the morning, 22 cars would exit in the, af it would exit in the morning. In the afternoon, 22 would enter, 14 would exit. So if you want to think about this, how could 81 apartment units not generate 81 exiting trips in the morning? Well, I guess the best way of being able to present that is my wife and I, we both go to work in the morning. I leave at 6.30, she leaves after 7. If the peak hour is between 7 and 8, my car is not counted, but hers is. Coming home, if she's home by 4.30 and I'm home after 6 o'clock, and the peak hours between five and six, neither one of our cars are counted. But on a daily basis they are, but not during that peak hour. So that's kind of where the rationale comes into play between the ITE trip generation numbers. The um, second evaluation that was conducted was to find out what the impacts would be if left turns were allowed in going northbound on Lowell Road to turn left into the site. So I'd like to talk about the benefits and the negatives associated with each one of them so at least we can all make a decision together. Um, the right in, right out, great. You don't have any, con any major conflicts. The real conflict is probably the right turns coming out, which is considered a minor conflict as compared to any left turns that would be made, whether they would be made from the main line or from a minor street or a driveway. 
So what we would be talking about is between five and ten right turns going into the site. That would be during the weekday morning peak hour, during the weekday evening peak hour, and during a Saturday midday peak hour. The right turns exiting would be between five and 15 vehicles per hour. Again, morning, evening, Saturday midday. All the left turn maneuvers would have to take place at Executive Drive, at that traffic signal. So a connection would be made from the site through Friars Drive into the park, and then any of the vehicles that wanted to go northbound from the site on Low Road would be able to turn left at the signal, and anybody that wanted to be able to turn left into the site would have to turn left in onto Executive Drive and be able to maneuver through the park to be able to get to Friars Drive and then to the site. So what are those vehicles looking like? The left turns that would be exiting, the additional left turns that would be exiting from Executive Drive to go northbound on Lowell Road would be between seven and 10 vehicles per hour during the morning, afternoon, and Saturday midday. The left turns coming northbound that would want to go into the site that would turn left from Lowell Road at Executive Drive would be between three and 14 vehicles per hour. So we're not talking about a lot of vehicles. And the reason why I can say it's not a lot is because ITE has a standard or a guideline. And they say that generally, if a development is going to have an, in, a development is going to have an impact, if it's going to generate over 100 vehicles per hour, this proposed development is not going to do that. Total trips, 30 in the morning, 36 in the afternoon, 41 on a Saturday. So we're, we're less than half of, of that threshold. Now that doesn't mean that the traffic should not be evaluated. That doesn't mean that safety should not be taken into consideration. Absolutely, everything should be looked at. And that's where sight distance comes into play based on the AASHTO standards as, um, as referenced within the, the town standards for uh, site plan regulations. And um, we meet those for anybody that wants to exit the site. They have to look to their left to see southbound oncoming cars. Um, since right turn vehicles exiting the site would not have to look to the right, but there's still ample distance looking to the right uh, because you want to make sure that no emergency vehicles are coming. So there, there's the available sight lines that are out there today exceed the minimum AASHTO standards. And this information has been reviewed by Fuss and O'Neill and has been identified within their comment letter. Um, and they, uh, Fuss and O'Neill have put together a comment letter dated May 29th, um, which review, it would combine the site review as well as the traffic review. Now, I had mentioned about the left turns that if that's the design that the town would like to move forward with, left turns coming into the site. I'm still recommending no left turns out. But the left turns into the site. So if someone was coming from Sagamore Bridge and they were coming northbound on Lowell Road and they wanted to turn left into the site, instead of turning left at Executive Drive and then maneuvering their way through the park to be able to get to the site, we're talking about an increase of left turns in that center turn lane of three to 14 vehicles per hour. That's one vehicle every four to 20 minutes. That's not a lot. Um, due, due to the northbound through traffic stream, especially during the weekday evening, I still don't, I don't recommend that left turn out, not under the existing conditions or what's even proposed. Um, but this development is certainly not going to have a significant impact on the traffic operations, and that's defended by the existing geometry that's out here today, the connection through to the park, and based on the ITE trip generation numbers. Um, definitely, I know that you're going to have questions, so fire away. So McGrath. The numbers that you cited for the trips in and out of the site, yes. are those for both phases of development or just the first phase? That's for all 81 apartment units. My, the traffic information that we've prepared ha, did not break them out into different phases. That was for the total development of the 81 units. Thank you. Mr. Ellery. Do you have a handout of that information available for us to review? It should be in my April 23rd uh, traffic impact assessment. 
and then we prepared a response to comments um, to Fuss and O'Neill's comment letter, and my letter was dated June 4th, and attached to that response to comments letter is the April 29th supplemental evaluation that looked at the potential of left turns in. Um, follow before. I will. <laughs> I Did you uh, actually go out and uh, watch the traffic over there in the mornings and evenings? Oh yeah, I've, I've, I've driven the corridor many, many times. And you're aware that uh, Low Road is essentially a failed road. We're almost there uh, from traffic volume. And do the ITE standards take into consideration that Low Road is a failed road? What what ITE does is that it gives you guidelines. Okay, it's not you need to do this everywhere in every town and every community in every state. Okay, it's just guidelines. Now based on those guidelines, um, it, they also say that if there are local thresholds, that we should take a look at those as well. So I, I don't wanna mislead you by any means. Now, that's because of that northbound stacking up going you know, along Lowell Road in the, in the evening. That's why I really don't recommend allowing the left turns out. Yeah, I, yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a given. Right. The problem with the uh, uh, in and out only okay. suggestion was that you're coming down a hill mm -hmm. and traffic in the morning in particular backs up all the way to the next set and sometimes the set beyond uh, Midas on Pelham Street uh, trying to get to the again because of a choke po uh, point situation of going from one lane to two and two lanes to one right um so the afternoon is given but in the morning you also have backed up traffic with people all not necessarily uh, being the most uh, courteous drivers to one another uh, heading southbound into the workplace in massachusetts trying to get over the bridge if you're, you're talking three to 14 cars, essentially making a left-hand turn or a right-hand turn into the property in, uh, per hour, mm -hmm. why would not a way to get them off of that lane and into the apartment more quickly mm -hmm. be beneficial to the traffic flow and to the town? So um, to, to address that, uh, we're, we're in discussions with the town engineer to try to, you know, really finalize the driveway design to find out what, what we can do, what should be done. Um, so that's part one. Part two is that if this was a state road, New Hampshire DOT does not provide or does not generally look at providing a deceleration lane or a taper for this type of a situation. And what I mean by that is this situation does not warrant an exclusive right turn lane just because of the low number of cars that would be turning right going southbound from Lowell Road into the site. So if it, you know, DOT's general guidelines, uh, and I talked to the Bureau of Highway Design about this, they had said that if you don't, if you don't need an exclusive right turn lane, then they would, not be, they would not support putting in a taper or a deceleration area. The reason for that is because if you have the taper or deceleration area without the right turn lane, then what happens is that, yes, you are going to be able to remove cars quicker off of Lowell Road by turning right in, but the problem is, is that you're increasing the speeds of those right turning vehicles onto the driveway, which then in the driveway is supposed to be more of a smooth transition rather than people coming in. I'll give you an example. The design criteria, the design guidelines that we use for a right turning vehicle, the speed is 15.15 miles per hour. If we are providing more of a taper or a deceleration area, that quickens up that speed. I know that the posted speed is 30 miles per hour and probably people are going faster when they can <laughs> along the whole road. But we certainly don't want people traveling at 30 miles per hour turning right in off of Low Road southbound. So what we've done is we're, we're working with Elvis right now to try to figure out what we can do to be able to almost find a balance, something that's not going to increase the speeds too much 
for cars to get in off of Lowell Road southbound, turning right in. And something that's going to be able to get them off a little quicker than going 15 miles per hour. If I'm not mistaken, though, they're not turning into a driveway. They're turn, turning into what will eventually, when phase two is completed, a town street. So, and in, in, in that's the same criteria on, on any kind of a design, where if you, if you look up and down the low road corridor and any of the unsignalized intersections or driveways, the unsignalized ones, there are no tapers. They're all at 90 degree angles. They're perpendicular intersections. And the reason for that is to be able to slow down while they're making that turn so they don't <coughs> crash into anybody that's trying to get out of that side street or out of that driveway. But like I said, we're working with Elvis to be able to come up with a design that, that would be able to achieve both. You know, one, being able to get the cars off a little quicker, and two, not too fast. That last point is, is a little worrisome to me because this was presented as a complete plan, and now you're saying it's not a complete plan. You still have some work to do on this particular intersection. Well, it, it's not a complete plan because I don't think that there's been a decision made as far as left turns in allowed or not. So I think that there's little tweaks here and there that can be made with staff, you know, in whatever direction that they, they feel is appropriate, whether it's with the town planner or the town engineer. We're, we're certainly willing to work with them. Now, one further question. Do you, sure. did you, is the fire chief still here? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you discuss with the fire department regarding the making a left-hand turn coming up from the low road station into the development? I, I did not. Elvis? Uh -oh. Mr. Diva. <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was, <coughs> was discussed, and I'm sure the chief can fill on that matter if the board wishes to hear that. Chief, thank you. Yes, we did meet with the um, developer, and we did a full access review. Um, one of the things that helps us in our response modeling is you need to remember you have Hampshire Drive, which is now directly across the street from the Lower Road Fire Station. So in your peak time staffing, or peak time travel times, we're gonna use Hampshire Drive and come through the industrial park and come up through the new Friars Drive access to gain access to the site instead of trying to go northbound. Um, there will the fire be department's a, afraid of a left hand turn on the low road. <laughs> no, no, we're trying to get out of the traffic and, and get out of everybody's way, to be honest with you. So we, we try to stay off of that, that area. So the accessibility into the site has been addressed, and we're, we're happy with the right in, right out. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Chief. Yep. Secretary McGrath. In the uh, staff report, it was referenced that. Uh, input from the town department heads and police department had they expressed a desire for a well-controlled right in right out access to the site uh, for public safety purposes but they also expressed concern for the site distance of southbound traffic approaching the site can you address that yes um so as part of our initial um study that we had done uh, dated April 23rd, we did measure the site distances. And that was from someone exiting the site, looking to the left, so they would be seeing low road southbound through traffic, you know, coming around the turn and coming down the hill. And also standing out there on low road at a certain distance to be able to see if you could see a car, if a car was going to turn right out of the driveway. So we did measure those distances. We did compare those to the AASHTO standards, and it was reviewed by Fuss and O'Neill and signed off on. So, to be explicit, you don't feel that there's an issue with the site distance? I feel that there's vegetation that's within the right-of-way that certainly could be trimmed seasonally, but as far as the layout of the roadway, that the site distances meet the minimum design standards as established by AASHTO. And those are, by the way, the AASHTO standards are a guideline and a resource that New Hampshire DOT, the town, and all New Hampshire municipalities use for site distances. So my suggestion for the town planner is to consult with the police department to 
make sure that they're satisfied with, with the site distance. Cool. And if they have any other concerns, they can express it directly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Dumont. I just had a question about your right turn. You, you had made a statement that it, you're designing so that way they would slow down. But the curve that's there, I don't see any different than what would be there as if you added like a, uh, uh, an additional lane on the side of that road for that way for people to get out of the way. So can you explain how that curve actually slows them down to 15 miles an hour? Because I see them going in so, at 30 or so, so, so the 15 mile per hour would be as if it would be a perpendicular intersection. Right. So anybody turning, you know, coming down and turning right in, they almost have to slow down at the turning speed. Not when they're actually still on low road, but the turning speed would be 15 miles per hour. This roadway is a little bit more angled. Correct. So that they can swing in a little bit more. And what we did was so we speed designed. Would increase. So, so the speed would increase already. Yeah. Not, not to the 30 mile per hour that I'm fearful of, but it certainly would already be able to accommodate the higher speeds for someone turning right in. And in addition, we're looking further with Elvis to see if there's a way that we could do a little bit more widening over there to provide more of an opportunity to be able to swing in. I think it would be wise to add that extra lane. Well, what we're trying to do too is we're trying to be cognizant of that Delta Island that we're proposing out there too, that we want it to be able to be designed in such a way that can discourage, I don't want to say restrict, because people are going to do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. Discourage the left turns in and the left turns out if that's the design that we're going to move forward with. I would assume that a, a right turn only lane on that side would help with that. It, see, the thing is, is that when you have between five and 10 vehicles per hour <coughs> yeah. during the peak hours, then you're pretty much putting asphalt wherever it's really not warranted. And I say warranted because there are different thresholds that we need to use as, as guidelines or we're gonna have asphalt everywhere. Um, this driveway layout has been designed to be able to accommodate WB50 trucks. So, you know, when, when I'm just looking at, you know, regular delivery vehicles or just passenger cars, I mean, this thing has been engineered. No, I understand that, yep. but a lot of those guidelines, like you said, are black and white cases, and I just don't feel as though this was that one of those cases, so that, that's just my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Orley. Uh, Mr. Veloso. Uh, Mr. Veloso? You can go first. Please. Right. Uh, regarding that triangle, thank you, Mr. Veloso. Uh, that triangle, and it's, and it's a, quote, acute nature because of the angles. Um, would that be raised or... Can it be enlarged in some fashion? Uh, is it possible that uh, besides a, you know, besides a do not enter sign, uh, some marking on, uh, which is in the suicide lane now is left and right turns. Can we get rid of one of those signs? Uh, we, we can't call them suicide lanes anymore. Well, I'm old enough to remember <laughs> suicide lanes. I, I am too. <laughs> uh, Particularly in the Midwest. Yes. <laughs> and then they suddenly disappear and you're really in the wrong lane. You, you, you know, I'm sorry to get off subject, but they used to call them suicide lanes because people used to be able to travel in them. Yeah. Now legally you can only go about 100 to 200 feet. Yeah. So this is the... <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's the background. The, but yeah. the question is, what would be the signage to discourage and what would be the... Uh, per perceived design of that triangle? And, and that would be, I think, Two of the key points. So with this, with this new kind of thought that we're working out with Elvis right now, is that doing a slight taper off of Lowell Road coming southbound, we may be able to increase the size of that island, okay? The Delta Island, so that it would further discourage left turns out and left turns in. Portions of that island would certainly be raised. It would be up in the air. And we want to also allow them to be mountable for emergency vehicles. Yeah. So there's no way that I'm going to sit here and tell you striping is going to do it because it's not. We, we all know it's not going to happen. That's why we need something raised over there. And anything that's raised, we can put a sign on. So the signs that you're talking about, that's definitely something we can also work out with the town engineer as far as a do not enter, a one way, how, how we want it right turn only. However the town wants us to move forward with it, we're, we're definitely open to it. But we want to, instead of us coming in saying, this is what we're going to do, we want to work with you. We okay. want to make sure that we're finding a, a, you know, a common solution. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Um, 
does your analysis and i understand that your analysis is focused and or devoted on the site itself but can your model or can your own analysis regarding left hand turns take into account potential future development of this 77 acres which my understanding is zoned for business purposes as well my concern here is that this analysis of three cars to 14 cars for purposes of a left hand turn doesn't take into account potential future development, especially if Friars Road is developed into a public way and that land opens up for potential future development. If there's additional commercial, business, residential applications in the 77 acres, this three to 14 car analysis on left-hand turns could increase exponentially given potential future development down the line here. So I, I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah. Um, by the way, I agree with you. Something that is going to be constructed on the remainder of that property would need to be taken a look at. Absolutely. I'm not here representing what that development is or what it could be because I don't know. I don't know if office, commercial, residential, I honestly don't know. Um, whatever those impacts are going to be could certainly have an impact at this driveway. Um, whether that's the left in, whether it's any other traffic control measures. Um, I, I don't want to throw anything out there because I, I just don't know and I don't want, you know, to put my name associated with something that is, is not submitted to the town yet. I'm not involved with that, the remaining of that property. I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. What I do know is I've been hired to take a look at this development in this intersection and look at the impacts that it has. Um, Yes, absolutely. The town should be aware of whatever is going to happen in the area, whether it's for the remainder of this parcel or for some of the other properties that are going on for sale or for lease up and down Low Road. Absolutely. Those are definitely things that the planning board and town staff should be aware of or planning for as well. So unfortunately, I'm not giving you a direct answer, and I know I'm not. I'm not trying to <laughs> fool you by that. Um, I just don't have an answer for you, but that is something that the town should be planning for in the future. No, I appreciate your candor. Mr. New. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, basically, the two options in front of you tonight is right in, right out, right in, right out, left in. Uh, that was because of the previous meeting by the Planning Board. It is a concern as you expand further. The left end is only to serve people that basically, in case they go down low road and they want to take a turn. The intent of having right in, right out was to force everyone through executive drive so we don't have to deal with that. We don't have to deal with that situation if in the future the rest of the lot gets developed or a portion of that that could be subdivided to two additional pieces we don't know. We believe that we can control the situation on Lowell Road better through a right in, right out. The applicant is providing two options to you because that's what the planning board asks. There are pluses and minuses to both of them. It's hard to determine which one is the best one. That will be up to you to decide and to vote on. Um, I believe the applicant's representative is trying to provide what the pluses and minuses are for each one of those scenarios but it's hard to determine which one is the best based on the current condition of what could happen. Uh, the engineer spoke about the numbers. Those numbers are only related to the units that have been developed, but it doesn't really take in consideration the people that will be cutting through Friar to go to Comcast, which has a lot of people working there. 32 executive, we have a significant sized business moving in at 32 um, in the next three to four months. That was already in the union leader. So those other things that will be adding to that right in, slowing down and all that, it's not set on stone yet. They're being very good to work with and they're good to listen to. Um, but as far as the entrance goes, there is pluses and minuses to that left. And there are risks associated with that. And that's why the police department um, stated that they have an issue with people taking a left end because even though the numbers could look 3 to 14, they could be much higher than that. And also, while the numbers don't look as bad on Lowell Road, looking at the models on the numbers, we all know people that live in town and work in town, what it really looks like they're doing peak hours. 
We also know that some of the peak hours in some quarters are five to six. We also know that Lowell Road is usually bad three to six, so, or two to six. Um, as schools get out at 2.30. So it's, I just want you to be aware of that, that the options are available for you. There's two of them, right in, right out, right in, right out, left in. Um, hopefully they can answer the answers for you to make the decision. I don't think there's a bad decision. I think it's just a matter of what you feel more comfortable with. I know what I feel comfortable with um, because I'm looking more for low road and other people moving in into this building. And that to me means right in, right out only but that's just my opinion. And that's, I just wanted to clarify, just kind of separate it a little bit so it doesn't get too much into, does it? Yeah. Before you step this. away, oh. I have a question. Um, you indicated that there may be traffic utilizing this entrance, the right turn in, in order to access Executive Drive, the, the far end of Executive Drive, which abuts this property. Do you have any idea what the numbers are for the for both of those Comcast and you mentioned that there's another business that's going to be moving in shortly? We can't find out. I don't know exactly the number. That, I think that that would be a, a good uh, idea to have. Yes. So because that can change the modeling that uh, that he's done. To your point, I just want to specify that what that that's a very uh, good point. It will be hard to determine if people are coming north or south, because obviously if they're coming from the south end, they'll be taking executive drive to go there. But everyone coming from the north, they will be eventually, once they find out that this is getting done and things are getting connected, they will, instead of sitting on low road during AM traffic, they will cut through basically to get to their office five minutes earlier. And, and just to add, add Please, a, right? Just to add a, a, an additional comment, the peak hour actually for Lowell Road right now, I believe, is more like two to seven. Because I, tra you'd think that it'd be six o'clock, but I travel to go to the meetings. I live in the very south end of town, so I have to go from almost the state line all the way up to uh, the town hall. So I travel that, that corridor. And often, t and I leave my house just before 6.30 to get, for, get to town hall for a seven o'clock meeting. Sometimes there's been a couple of occasions where I've had to turn around, go back, get onto Wasson Road, and go loop around so that I avoid all of the standing traffic on Lowell Road. And that's at 6.30. Yeah. And you're right. Typically for a.m. and p.m. hours are usually 6.30 to 8. We do have them 6 to 8.45 at Lowell Road. And at the Common, Library Common, that's at 8.30. We can't seem to clear around 8 o'clock. We need an additional half an hour. Yep. So they I vary. Wanted, yeah, I wanted to point that out because it's, it's deceptive. You'd mm -hmm. think that it would be, you know, till 6 o'clock. Most people are on their way home from work at, you know, yep. around 4.30, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. But it actually, it's extended on Lowell Road because of the, the traffic, because of that bottleneck, too. And there's different days for different traffic. Sometimes there's traffic out there that absolutely makes no sense in the morning or in the afternoon. Like today, it seemed to be light. I don't know for what reason. Um, so we have those. It's, it's just traffic. It's not constant. So, so again, the study for traffic, you need to take that into consideration that sometimes the, the peak hour actually is longer, peak hours are longer than what you, you would normally use for a normal situation. And this isn't normal. And they are working with our numbers, the traffic volumes. It's something we provided to them based on our data that the planning board has the cameras up. So if there's no other questions. No, not for you. Yeah. Mr. Lowe. Oh. Thank you, Elvis. Um, the, the question that uh, Slockman McGrath brought up regarding and the point that Elvis brought, uh, added to brings something to mind that you said regarding the ITE standards and to your discussion with the DOT. If you factor in the use of this road as an access to the two or three businesses that are at the end of Friars Drive, would that justify a um, turning lane 
to the New Hampshire DOT. Uh, you mean for an exclusive right turn lane coming down? Yeah. Low road south. Coming down hill. I honestly don't know. And, and I don't know how much traffic, like Elvis said, we don't know how much traffic is entering into those businesses in the back there that are coming southbound on Lowell Road in the morning or northbound on Lowell Road. We just don't know that information. So I wish I could give you a direct answer, but I just, I, I don't know. I, this may not be a question for you. It may be a question for the, uh, if I can follow up with you. Thank you. Uh, for the developer, would, if they, uh, New Hampshire DOT approves that. Would the developer be willing to participate in the development of that turn lane to help, to handle this increased flow on Friars Drive? So we're getting into an interesting area now because what has happened is this project does not need any of these improvements that we're talking about. And in fact, the only reason we're talking about the additional traffic is because the developers, Mark Pilat and, and Dakota, <laughs> um, because they agreed to take it through, take Friars Drive through. Um, that's not necessary from the standpoint of this project, but it is planning uh, as has been suggested, is important. Uh, it's planning really for the back side. So um, what, it, what Dakota Properties has done is they've offered to a 50-foot right-of-way to connect everything. They've offered to make the first part of that connection uh, because Elvis thought it important now. And uh, that entrance itself is, is beefed up uh, beyond the needs of this project because of the things we've talked about. So I don't know that it's fair to ask them to contribute more uh, to something that isn't there yet and is not something that they caused. You know, I think right now what has happened is um, Mark Pilat and Dakota Partners have worked very hard to uh, accommodate the planning needs, uh, knowing that uh, this board is interested in, in the longer term. Uh, but. There's only so much you can ask of, of this particular project. <clears throat> really? Yeah. <laughs> and I guess the other thing that I would say is that's all in the context of a workforce housing project, which starts out with all of the economics against it, uh, especially when it's a, a rental project. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Appreciate but I, I see Mark moving forward here. Do you? Did you have anything else that you wanted to add to that, Mark? No, I, I think the only thing I wanted to add to it was in the sense that you know, Mark Pallott with uh, Dakota Partners. One other thing I wanted to add, add to this was uh, we did receive from Brian a, an impact piece. And one of these things, there's two parts to it. One is schools and one is traffic which my understanding that goes to these types of situations. So I would assume we're already contributing to that in that fashion. So and that's why we're working closely with Elvis to find a solution that works for both us as well as the town. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm I'm, uh, I don't have anything else to add unless you have a particular question. I'm happy to try to answer questions or... I think at this point we'll put it to public input. Thank you very much. Tim, can you make a statement before you even get started with public input about what this development really is, that it's not Section 8 housing? Just to confirm it for anybody that's watching. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I can make that. Do it. How's that. What's that? How about I have the applicant do it? That's fine. It's, yes, uh, this is not Section 8 housing. This is not government housing. This is private housing. It's a private multifamily development. It happens to be workforce housing because the state of New Hampshire demands more workforce housing. Uh, uh, industry needs housing that can be afforded by people of median income, and that's what this does. But it's no more than that. It's not subsidized. It's not Section 8. It's not, uh, you know, uh, 
we've heard all kinds of rumors. It's just not any of those things. It's regular old multifamily housing. Can you also address the tax credit that's referenced in the, the report? Because so, that's not from the town, the town that's giving you a tax credit. No. So can you elaborate on that, please? Absolutely, and, and thank you for the question. Um, so New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority is an authority that's established at the state level that provides bonds for financing. And because they have financing, um, developers want it. They want the money. It's just you borrow the money. What New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority does is they provide incentives to get what the state needs. The state is in a, um, it's a, a critical need for workforce housing, affordable workforce housing, and that's especially true on the rental side of things as we have talked. So all that is happening is the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority has provided certain incentives to get better projects. One of them is the special designs that we heard about earlier. Uh, that gives you more points in the uh, competition to get this uh, bond funding through the state. But there is no subsidy. Um, there's, the tax credit is federal tax credit. It's, it's, it's just a way to help uh, assist in the financing. There's no impact to the state, I mean to the city or town of uh, Hudson. It's just that Hudson gets the benefit uh, of a program that the state has determined is very important. That's a clever way of putting it. <laughs> well, it's pretty much true, too. Mr. Rowley? Yeah, I just want that the requirements that HFA puts on you and that the federal government puts on for the tax credits are incentives, but they're, they're strings that structure a very finite type of construction and who can get, gain access, who can't gain access, what the uh, entry levels are. Is that a correct statement? Ab absolutely, yes, absolutely. So when you hear us talk about income restricted, that's, in, that's a rule that is imposed to get the financing. And uh, New Hampshire Housing wants us to um, provide housing across the scale of incomes. So that's why we have some that's at 50%, some that's at 60% of the median incomes. That's, that's how that happens. But the tax incentive is a federal tax that enables outside investors to get tax credits. It, it has nothing to do with Hudson. You just get the benefit of it. Thank you. Everyone good? All right. So that public input, right? yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to public input at 838. Um, so go up to the microphone, please state your name, address, spell your name for the recorder. Um, we have a sign-in sheet. Sign -in oh, sheet. we actually have a sign-in sheet. So, and then ask your questions. We ask you to keep it in a couple minutes. 20, 30 minutes. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Nice to see a planning board meeting live. Um, I have two questions and a comment. My first question is, I heard that the attorney say that uh, they were moving the buildings back 10 feet. Is that so that we could have a 10-foot donation of that land so that if Lowell Road ever did need to be widened, we would have the land in the town's possession? Number two, they say they have 12 other properties. Has anybody done the research to go out and take a look at the parking situation, whether the 1.5 would cut it and what the existing properties they have? And finally, my comment. After hearing the, the plan for the intersection, I would suggest that you put a gate across that driveway and use it for emergency use only. Because as soon as that road is built, Google Maps will be having hundreds of people trying to get out of the industrial park using that, that roadway. Thank you. I have a sign and state it on the microphone. The name. Oh, yeah. If 
you could still state your name. Margaret St. Ange. And your address. 238 Fox Hollow. Floor is yours. So, first I want to make a statement, and that is I have nothing against them being built or anything like that. My whole thing is the traffic impact. So, as a person who drives up and down Route 3 more than once between work and errands and everything else like everybody else, and I am right there in Fox Hollow, I want to make a couple of statements. First of all, coming down that hill, if you are stopped at the red light at the Town Tavern Plaza there, and then you give it the gas, you are giving it the gas right as you're going over that hill. You're doing that maximum at, at 30 miles an hour. And if somebody in front of you is slowing down to turn in, then you're going to hit the brakes and the person behind you who has not quite peaked that hill hasn't hit their brakes yet. That's a concern for me. There isn't enough visibility to see that. And a perfect example of that is at the set of lights at Executive Drive and PMA. So now I'm going 30 miles an hour. It's a green light and the car in front of me hits his brakes because now he's taking a right. I hit my brakes, the guy behind me swings into the left turn, the left lane, to go around me because they don't want to hit their brakes. And now we're both like, it's just a mess. I'm telling you, it's just not going to work. I can just, from experience. Now, you talked about putting in that, what do you call that road? But like it's to, to slow, slow down. Slow down. No. No, but what do you I call slip lane? Oh, deceleration. Slip lane. Thank deceleration. you. I never knew what that was called. Slip lane. Now, go back a mile and go to the north entrance of Fox Hollow. We have a slip lane. Yes, we do. It's you pull over. I slow down. I put on my directional. I slow down. I pull down to the right. You can pass me. Okay, and that works. It's perfect. So I'm really concerned about coming down around that hill. And I, I just think it's going to be a problem. I personally, I like that idea of having a gate, and it's just for emergencies only. There is no reason why. There's already executive drivers there. I don't understand why we have to have that. The second reason I don't think we should have that there at all is a perfect example is the Irving Gas Station, that Town Tavern Plaza, and it used to be where Domino's Pizza is. I'm not quite sure if it's still there or not is one of those right turn onlys, right? Do you guys all agree with me? At Irving Gas Station? No. That new one? Hmm. Yes. No? I don't, I don't, I don't remember. Right out. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay, hand to God. They're in that suicide lane taking left because they don't want to go to the lights and take a left. Okay, Town Tavern? Same thing. If you, uh, if you want to go work out at the gym and you're going south on Lowell Road, you have to stop at those lights to take a left. There's a bunch of people early in the morning that do not want to do that, so they go straight through the light when it's green, go into the suicide lane, and turn into that town tavern plaza. Hand to God, I see it every day. Okay? So if they're doing it, you're going to see it over there, too. It's going to be a disaster. So my, here's my thing. If you can put a gate or something just for emergency only, I would be really happy. If you don't, I would like to know if you guys could have a plan in the back to sit there and after six months or a year say, you know what, we made a mistake, we need to change it. Because if you do this, you've got to find a way to admit that it doesn't work and then change it because it, you're going to have a lot more accidents. That's what my concern is, is more accidents. It's for people's safety. That's the only reason why I don't want it. The second thing is, when you talked about the traffic coming in and out, you based it on 81 units. And if I heard you right, you said 81 cars. If there's 81 units, there's a lot more than 81 cars that are in that, coming in and out of there. There's got to be close to 150 cars coming in and out of there. You said workforce. They're working. They're going to be coming in and out. You, you've got to direct your questions. Oh, this sorry. And the, and the second thing is, sorry. And the second thing is, you said 1.5 parking. I can tell you, so Stabile built Fox Hollow. And 
the planning board or whatever said you had to have two parking spots for every home that was there. There's 240 units. And he got away with, we, we went out there and we counted them, and he missed out on 36 parking spots. And we made him turn around and put in those 36 parking spots, and most of them are being used. So I think doing 1.5 is not going to be enough. And, my, and a perfect example of that is when you go to snowplow that area, where are those cars going to go if you don't have extra parking spots? They have to move to a different area so you can plow them, and then they have to go back. If you don't have those extra spots, they're going to be parking all the way down Friar Drive when there's a snowstorm, and they need to plow. So those are my, those are my opinions. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Norman Boyer. I'm a property owner at uh, 156 and 162 Laurel Road. So there's two reasons why I, I pass that out. Uh, at the next board meeting, we're going to talk about the conceptual plan I have for a five, uh, ten pump gas station on that particular property. Uh, my biggest concern tonight is to excuse me. This this application is going to be on a meeting and yeah, is going to be publicly it has noticed. To do with this plan. I understand, sir. And I'm referring. I'm referring. This Brian, this referring will jeopardize your application. Plan, okay, so that the board can understand what I'm referring to. I am concerned with the driveway at its present position. Okay. I'd like to see it moved north on Lowell Road, at least 10 if not 20 feet, so that the two driveways would be opposite one another. Because well, I can tell down the road, we're going to be looking at a street light there. And there's no sense. You can take this back, because we're going to look at this when you present it to the board. Right. We're, okay. we're talking about. I'll use their plan notice. then, Marilyn. You can use their plan, but we're not going to consider anything. No, I, I'm your not. Property. I don't want you to consider. It. What I would like you to consider is to have this driveway or this road, Friar Road, moved north, so that eventually the two driveways would would match. That, the the that, possibility is that you could move your driveway south by Well, I can't, Marilyn, no, because the, the, the land doesn't so, belong so to me. We've got to stop. Huh? we got to stop. Okay. Uh, we can't talk about your okay. future plans because your plans are okay. approved. Fine. I, as far as uh, site distance is concerned, uh, if you folks did look at the sheet I gave you, okay, and this refers to this particular project, okay, one of the principals that owns this particular land owns the property with the green highlighted in it, and possibly the board or the developers could ask him for an easement to improve the site distance to the north, okay? That, now, now you can throw that thing away if you want. Okay, uh, parking. Okay, I own about uh, 40 rental properties, and I don't have anybody that only has one car. Okay, I, I rent to a state cop. He's got a state police cruiser, and he's got his personal vehicle. I rent to an infinity technician. He has his infinity van, and he has his personal vehicle. Everybody else has two, three cars, so I just think that the board should seriously look at 1.5, like the young lady from Fox Hollow said. Okay. Uh, I don't know, I haven't been told, but when Mission Point went in down Lower Road by the new fire station, they were asked to put in a street like there. 
And as far as I know, there's only 68 units at Mission Point. And they, they extended the uh, road out from the industrial park and they matched that up. And you notice that that works very well. Okay, another point I wanna make, the right turn, right turn in, right turn out is fine. But I'm gonna tell you, just like the fire chief said, there's less traffic in the industrial park. People coming down the lower road at uh, 7.30 a.m. going southbound, they're gonna see that they have an opportunity to make a right-hand turn. They're gonna buzz down Friar Drive, take a left, gonna come out down by Dunkin' Donuts, and they're gonna figure they, they missed two or three street lights. That's just, you, you know, so we're talking some serious traffic here. Because I tell you, people do anything, anything on Laurel Road, as everybody knows, okay? We have people turning into our establishment, banging a Yui, they go into uh, Nottingham West, turn in there, uh, go back out the street light to re change directions. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, oh, there was just one other question. Uh, the piece of property that uh, Dakota is uh, purchasing, does it go all the way up to Fox Hollow in back of the residential properties on Laurel Road? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Your subdivision, you, you folks are. Does it go all the way up to Fox Hall? Yes. Mm -hmm. It does? Okay. You have to remember, too, you know, I know that they have a lot of other locations, but there's no public transportation to speak of, basically, in Hudson. Okay. So, like the young lady said, everybody's going to need a car. I, I think, you know, 1.5 is, I think they're asking for problems, but, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chen, the, uh, the, what is it, 121 versus 161 and 162 would be the difference between 1.5 and? Yeah, 122 versus 162. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's get through the public input and spaces. Board members can. State your name and address for Todd Boyer, 2 Merrill Street in Hudson. So, as a resident of Hudson, I will tell them I do not have a problem with the project. I do not have a problem with 81 apartments going in. I personally don't have a problem with the design of it. I think it's fine. My problem turns to when I become a direct of butter. If anybody wants some real world Lowell Road information, I don't have a degree, I don't have any studies, but I can promise you, I can give you real world information. I'm at 156 Lowell Road from 4.30 in the morning till 6.30 at night. I own Boyer's Auto Body. I'm in that front lot moving trailers, moving bodies. I see it all day long. Your peak traffic hours on Lowell Road is from 4.30 in the morning until roughly 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. Your peak travel times at night are roughly 3 o'clock till about 6.30. There is, in my opinion, no good reason not to have a deceleration lane going into this project. Now, I want to go into the fact that we have or I should say the board has suggested 
that the applicant extend Friars Drive. And now, because we have done that, we are starting to think about what problems that could arise. Extra businesses out back, realizing that they can make a right-hand turn, zipping down Friars Drive. Extra people coming down Friars Drive because they don't want to go to the street light. Because maybe they live northbound and it's quicker or further down Lowell Road than them going to a street light. So now all we have done is we have asked the applicant to extend Friars Drive and we've dumped more traffic at that intersection that we have asked them to create. So if we go back to their first original application where they actually had a driveway coming out of their property with a left out, left in, right out, right in, and it's only their 81 apartments, then all the statements that they made over here tonight about this is this project, it's this project that we're dealing with. We don't know what the future is gonna hold. We don't know what's gonna go on in the back. It's this project. This project only has, I think the numbers were three to 15 cars per hour. Then let's look at that and see if that is what makes sense. Because we are, or the board is, I believe, after hearing the information tonight, opening a can of worms by asking them to extend Friars Drive. In addition to that, we're asking the applicant to spend their money on extending Friars Drive, which they're willing to do, and not take into account that we could ask them to improve Lowell Road. Now, everybody on the board, and I've heard it in town, we don't want Amherst Street. Folks, we're already there. We're already there. We have Amherst Street. It's just a two-lane road, north and south. So what are we going to do about it? We have an opportunity here that an applicant's going to spend thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, I don't know, but they're going to spend real money improving Friars Drive because of what may go on on the back property. We don't know what's going to go on on the back property. So why do we worry about it? Why don't we ask them to spend that money on Lowell Road and make Lowell Road better for everybody in the town? It just makes good sense to me. As far as I'm concerned, a planning board should try to plan for the future. Well, if we don't know what's going to happen on the back lot, then why do we worry about it? Let's worry about what's right in front of us. What's right in front of us? Lowell Road. I think we can come up with something better. And I'm going to tell you right now that the traffic data <coughs> is data that they're coming up with. You can't tell me that you're going to look at me and tell me that it is work force housing and then tell me that less than 20% of those people are going to be leaving to go to work at a certain time of day on a certain time of day yes however a lot more than 20% of those people have to work and let's face reality when does everybody go to work during the peak times that I just stated that's about all I got. I just want the right thing for the town. All right, thank you. Anyone else in the public? Seeing none, we'll close the public input at 9 p.m. Sorry, 9 p.m. And, and just to point out, there's less than 10 people from the general public attending this meeting. There There's is. a number of staff and town officials here, but of the general public, there's less than 10 people. And that's a shame, because this is a big project that is going to have 
consequences for everyone that travels Lowell Road. And for those that did attend, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, would the applicant like to respond to any of the public input? Well, I, I, just to clarify one thing anyway, <clears throat> uh, Jason Plourd's numbers were actual numbers. You know, he, he worked with uh, Elvis and they counted. So, while I appreciate that the uh, the peak time seems broad and, and longer. The numbers reflect what is actually out there. Uh, the other thing is there was a, a, a misunderstanding. These, there's 81 units, but I don't think Mr. Plut said there was 81 trips. He said there were, uh, he, he counted the trips at different hours, and I think the reports bear that out. It actually shows for, I believe it's 400 trips a day, but 81 homes. And with regard to the parking, <clears throat> the reason that Dakota Properties uh, is proposing one and a half is because mo half of their units are one bedroom. And one bedroom, their experience is there's less than one car per unit when it's a one bedroom unit. We agree that when it's a two bedroom unit, it's likely to be more than one car. But, uh, and, and other than that, we'll just leave it right there. Okay, board members. Can we talk about the waivers? And we can talk about whatever you'd like right now. Well, I have questions about the waivers, so. All right. We have questions on the waivers. If you want, want to answer sure. them. Sure, I'd be happy to give it my best. So taking uh, the number of parking spaces, you're suggesting uh, one and a half spaces, but if the need arises, if if town staff, our code enforcement officer, determines that there's a need for additional spaces, um, then the applicant would has the uh, ability to put in the additional spaces so that it actually becomes two per unit? Yes, so um, on that plan right there, at, at the bottom of the plan uh, is Lowell Road. To the upper right, is where that extra space is and it's been designated as an area that can easily be expanded and we've checked all of the uh, access and, and uh, emergency um, turn ratios and all that and that, and that all works <clears throat> so one one suggestion has been that there be some sort of review at the phase two uh, so because we are going to build one building in phase one, and, the, and phase two will be a second, uh, it'll be next year. Let's say you hope to build yeah. one building to start. Um, okay, so that, that clarifies for me. Yeah. And so has code enforcement, our zoning administrator, is he aware of, of that suggestion and is he comfortable with that? because that relies on him I actually think, going out and, and determining right. whether or not there's a need. I think my initial impression of why the applicant proposed it to be the zoning administrator was, and this is a guess, is that the, the notion that if he received complaints, that, that he's the complaint receiving official, lucky him. Um, but I think what I've heard from Mr. Leonard is the idea that prior to phase two of the building, um, that there would be some sort of review mechanism, whether that be a planning board mechanism or, or otherwise. So the, the, the sort of contingency or legal provision to determine <coughs> if two is needed, um, that's, that's one of the things we're here to talk about. Um, so, that, so that would have to be, we'd have to ensure that that would take place mm -hmm. so that at some point in the future, if it doesn't happen, and then there are complaints that they're already past that point where right. they'd be able to put in the additional parking spaces. And that's unfair to the residents that, that might be mm -hmm. utilizing it. And I'm familiar with Fox Hollow only because my brother lived there for a time, uh, a number of years ago. And there were always complaints about parking. And he had two spaces for his unit. And there was some additional parking. Um, at the end of the buildings for, for visitor parking, but there were always complaints. 
and there was never enough parking. And I, are, think I, would, that I would offer that those are different unit types. They may be, but still, complaints do exist. Mm -hmm. People are people, and they have company, and they have visitors. And uh, if there's not enough parking, then um, so it I, I understand so. your concern, and I think uh, uh, Brian Growth mentioned early on that we've got we got to work out some of the uh, the details of how we agree to this, and we've actually talked with uh, Attorney Lefebvre. Uh, regarding that. I think that's one of the things we have to work out, just how will this process work, but we can tell you that we're willing and open uh, to that concept. Because it's, it's either that or we just don't grant the waiver. Yeah. I mean, that's... Yeah, so we're, so we're open to that. Perhaps, perhaps some of the, the solution is to have the applicant um, propose what that, how that con this contingency works so that the board can then consider that. Okay. So then on the existing conditions, um, one of the questions that went in your presentation, and I don't remember exactly what you said that caused me to write this down, but um, what happens if Dakota Properties decides that they no longer want to be um, in workforce housing and they either sell the property or they sell something it to happens, if yeah. something happens? <clears throat> Can you explain what would happen then? Well, um, and with all of the agreements that have been made. So, particularly the uh, qualifications that would be necessary for people to move into the, the units. So, the way the financing works is there will actually be restrictions and covenants on the property that require it to continue as workforce housing. In perpetuity? Uh, usually it's 30 or 30 years. It's a minimum of 30 years. Sometimes it's 30 to 40. Is there any way to lengthen that time so that it, um, you know, 30 years can, as you and I know, Jay, can go by pretty quickly. Way too quickly. <laughs> so, yeah, no, you know, I, 30, I hear you, I think. 30 years may, I mean, it may be a, a good time for, for having a mortgage on a property, but <clears throat> in reality, maybe it should be a longer period of time. Well, so there's, the there's kind of pros and cons to that, to yeah. be honest with you. Uh, things change so much mm -hmm. over 30 or 40 years. I, I think the feeling is that you don't want to restrict things too much longer than that. Now, the reason that the, uh, that it is restricted because the financing, the bonds, and all of the rules that are associated with the state programs do require that it be a, a covenanted uh, workforce housing project. So, so you, they're kind of balancing it um, at the 30 or 40 years. So you can guarantee 30? Yeah, 30 40. I can guarantee at a minimum of 30, and it may actually be. Uh, Mark can probably tell me better. I don't quite know myself, yeah. but I would check the requirements once we file the application, because that will each year it's set with the application. I can tell you that I, I did one uh, project and financed uh, one in Londonderry, and it was 30 years at a minimum. And then the last one is the roadway requirements. And the one comment that I would have, because, because of my tenure uh, in town, and being on the planning board for a number of years. I've witnessed right in and right in, right turn in and right turn out that, you know, typically you'd think it would work, but people are people and they take left-hand turns into right turn out areas and vice versa. So my comment is that that little, uh, triangle that's shown, and I forget who said that it would be elevated at, at some points, uh, but I've got a note here to elongate that island entrance so that it causes people that they'd have to go in f deeper into the development before they'd be, at, be able to turn and take a, a left. So that's my comment, because I think that Irving Gas is a perfect example 
right turn in, right turn out, and as the lady uh, got up and commented, and other people have told me about it, they've witnessed it, people taking left-hand turns in, left-hand turns out, and it's all supposed to be right, right turn in and right turn out. So it's just human nature, but the best that we can do to try and prevent that. Yeah. With regard to the, the right turn in, right turn out, and the deceleration, of course, in every traveled way, there's a shoulder that people tend to pull over and slow down in. That's a typical and expected traffic motion. Um, what I think Jason Plourd was talking about was we, you don't really want another lane because it causes other issues. But I agree that people will pull over to slow down. The other thing I, I, I can't help but say that Fox Hollow's got an awful lot more bedrooms than we're talking about here. That's, that could be three or four I, times I as just, much. I just know that the unit that my brother had, I think, had two bedrooms. That, so that'd be our largest unit. Yeah. And there's 240 over there, there's 80 here. I just know that it, it's, been a, it's been a problem over the years for them. Yeah, I, I hear you. So that's all I have about the waivers, and I have other comments as we go deeper into the project, but I thought waivers was a good place to start. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the comments on the waiver, because to the extent that we can eliminate some of these and resolve them, then we can focus on the, the one or two things that uh, remain. The more difficult aspects. Mr. Van Veen. On sheet six, it says condo lands. What does that mean? Um, I expect that that is for that is for financing. So, uh, what happens in these things in, in phases? The financing will be for phase one, and then the next wave of financing would be for phase two. And in order to do that, you either have to have two separate lots, or you have a condominium that is basically one building and then another building. This will not be condominiumized uh, for the living units. It'll be condominiumized, or it may be condominiumized for the two buildings themselves. Um, so what sheet was that? Six. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Oh, and the question Sorry. was uh, on sheet six. The, uh, the lot is divided into two areas, condo land area one and condo land area two, and you're saying that's financing. Yes, that's exactly what that is. Yeah. So it's like a phase line, but it's solely for purposes of, uh, and I'm glad you asked the question because there's absolutely, this is not a condominium in the traditional sense of selling a, each residential unit as a unit. That's not going to happen. This is a rental project. I'm going to add another comment. Uh, on the parking, yeah, I know Fox Hollow might have more bedrooms than this particular plan, but the bedrooms and car aren't correlated directly because most of the time you have a, a home or a, a, a condo or an apartment, and the adults in the apartment have the cars, and the other bedrooms are probably going to go to kids who don't have the cars. So I don't think saying Fox Hollow has more bedrooms and that's why too, too, it's too cramped for parking. I think, I think you're going to have the same issue. Many of us have lived in apartment complexes and we know parking is always a premium and to, to, uh, to back it off to one and a half, especially with the snow removal issues and so forth. And I, I don't think that's going to work and I'm not really in favor of a wait and see attitude on it because you know you, you, people are moving in here and they've got to live with it and from even you know visiting people and and, and trying to find a parking space in an apartment complex is, is a nightmare at times and to, to to reduce the number of parking spaces allowed I, I just don't think that's the right thing to do that's all i have okay other board members I just Mr. have a question for Brian. Uh, have the impact fees been calculated? What this, what they would be for this development? Um, yeah, I did that. 
a while ago. I don't have that number on me, but it's I believe it's just a little over four hundred thousand dollars when you everything together. So I, I thought it might be important to explain to everybody that, that, that what that money is supposed to go towards as far as the corridor there and improving Willow Road. I know a lot of people do have issues with that, but that is something that needs to be considered by everybody. That money that's supposed to get used in that yeah, and fashion. That, that figure, that four hundred thousand dollars is inclusive of uh, school recreation and traffic. Traffic represents I want to say about 30% of that. Okay. And so recently we've been using um, corridor funds um, to upgrade our traffic lights signalization and coordination systems um, which we have seen real results from and we do have traffic counts uh, up and down Mall Road all day and night. Um, and it's used for other things to uh, assist in the alleviation of traffic along that particular corridor. Thank you. Mr. Uh, the question was asked regarding uh, Fox Hollow, and if you, this, what's up on the board now shows that the, I think it shows that the developed space is in the light green area, and then the rest of it is essentially wild space or growth space, and that's on a slope of about 12, 15 feet. Uh, and very short, it's kind of a steep slope according to the gradient plan. Do you mind if I ask you the question? So we are saying that dark green is what they're, they're purchasing as the, as the subdivision? That's part of the subdivision, but that's, that's un, um, undeveloped land. Actually, undevelopable, undevelopable land. Too many of them. Yes, once this project, should you approve this project as it's shown, the top portion of that remains as it's shown right there. Tree. It, it's, it's, pardon me? That top portion is developable. There is only a small area that has a steep slope restriction. Yeah, I mean, he's talking about, That's all. That's but, but you can't put another building there because it's part of the project. Yeah, in green yeah. space. Too far out of the way, it doesn't really work. And it gets too close to the neighbors. Right. don't want that. Mr. Collins. Uh, I just have one comment in regards to the intersection at Low Road. And uh, there is a lot of concern with this right in, right out tactic that we're using. And some people expressed their concerns tonight about people inadvertently, we'll call it, taking left hand turns <laughs> onto the site. Uh, and I, I, myself, I think that a left hand turn into the development is perfectly acceptable. You do have a uh, center lane that you can idle in until the, it is clear. But if you design that in such a way that inhibits that movement, uh, people will still do it anyway. They're just going to do it more abruptly and possibly, you know, cross into oncoming traffic in order to beat it. So if if the intersection is relooked at. It, like I said, I have no problem in a left-hand turn when people are heading north up Low Road. So, and it's a start on making sure that's an, a safe access to the site and a safe access from the site. So, it's just like to remind you, that engineering, planning, and police have all expressed, uh, recommended the right in, right out. I, I understand that. I'm, I'm just voicing my my opinion on it. Any other board members? Mr. Dean? I got too much paperwork here, right? I'll tell this. <laughs> and I apologize for getting into it, and I, and I don't know if this is worth bringing it up or not, but yeah, I'm wondering if it is advisable, or if, if I can, if I may suggest that maybe the board, the planning board makes a suggestion or at least a recommendation to how the applicant should move forward with finalizing the access. Because right now they're still looking at two. I understand, as I said earlier, there's no wrong decision. It's just a matter of what this uh, board feels comfortable with. Again, if you look at the Lowell Road, right in, right out. If you look at the access, right in, right out, left in. I think the applicant has done a significant work, and as they get closer to the finish line, which is completing the plans, I think that maybe this board needs to make a decision to at least 
finalize which way they should go, because right now we're still stuck between these two options. Mr. Dumont. And this is just a thought of mine that I have. Uh, is it possible for this board to, to approve a ward and I uh, based on, uh, I guess, making it conditional upon a minor site plan review of the access? Is that possible to piecemeal no. it that way or no? So they would, because like you said, it's still open at this point. They're not really deciding on one way or the other. I know we have the engineer's recommendation, but. What, what Mr. Dima is suggesting, though, is since we anticipate this hearing to last, obviously more than one, one meeting, um, is it the, the board provide, uh, further provide the applicant with direction in terms of how they should resolve the design of this intersection um, to, to move this uh, um, application forward? Okay. Um, staff has provided their recommendations. The uh, applicant has provided their testimony from their traffic consultant. Um, so I mean, we, I guess uh, I think both sides have brought it far, as far as we can to the board. And, so at this point, the board's going to make a decision if they want right in, right out, or if they want to do some other version of the intersection. Mr. Randy. Question for all. Mr. Elvis. So the, uh, the Friar Drive extension into the, the, the original reason for that was so to have fire access, fire truck access, right? There was two reasons, uh, fire access and complete the original plan of the fire drive, which was to connect the lower road at some point. And the third says, reason. And the third reason? Instead of having multiple, multiple driveways uncontrolled leading out to lower road, this organizes future and potential development into controlled intersections. It's a, in the long term, a far better option than allowing how, who knows how many curb cuts on Lowell Road accessing all these new de potential development. Yeah. And having a situation of a flag lot, so you have a massive lot in the back, but only 50 feet of frontage on Lowell Road, so better as uh, the town planner said, better uh, access management as we yeah. Thank you. So that, that would be the third option. Okay. It was for us, we think it's a better product at the end of the day, it's a better planning, short term and long term. And we don't have to deal with access on no road anymore once this gets completed. Mr. Collins. I guess one follow-up question on that. It is hard to hear, and so maybe somebody did answer this, but Fry's Drive, any improvements will be done during the phase one construction point. In other words, that that is part of phase one. On phase with one. With the first building. Let's just call it the first building being built. Wait, wait no, we don't separate phases now. Right. So, well, can you re rephrase your question, please? Uh, so, uh, the first, with the first building, building yeah. being built, uh, Fry's Drive is also part of those improvements yes. to the site. Not, it, I was reading through the roadway waiver requirement, and it seemed like there was a, a delay in there somewhere. So, there's, it, there's, there's a, a delay in accepting to, it. But well, there's a phase. Delay. There's right. a phase condition to that, the road, right? As well as, in addition to, there's, that's in the staff report. That's what. Right. There's sort of three different notions of what phase means mm -hmm. in this plan, and we need to make sure that we have it's that organized in our right. discussions. It is part of phase, the first building being built, and all they would the need that in order to get right. to the, right. yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure. Thank you. So just to address that phasing, I believe when they do the residential portion, it's going to be brought to our residential standards, and then in the future, if the back portion went to a commercial, then that road would have to be upgraded to a commercial standard. Yes. That's where the phasing comes in for the roadway itself. Yes. Very correct. Right. Mr. Vandy. By commercial standards to match what's currently in the industrial park. 32, 32 feet. That's the width of Is that, that fire. The industrial yes. park right now? That would be fire drive, correct. Mr. Miller. And if I, I believe I understand the town's correct, you could have a residential road in and out. A business or commercial road begin on the same street. I don't see why not. The road is being built to serve this. It will probably be utilized for the commercial impact. If they don't like it, they don't have to use it. If they do like it, then that's fine. But if the second piece in the back will be utilized for commercial, then that will be required to update the road to the width of 32 feet, all the way down probably to 
Um, so future, future development may have to. Yes, we just simply can't justify that additional cost for something that will only be used for residential right now. Let me answer that question. So to loop back to, to the entrance, yeah. if the so public wishes. I guess it would be maybe appropriate for someone to make a motion to continue the planning phase with whichever scenario we want to make the motion. So it would be right in, right out. That will give them a defined direction when they walk out of here. Ms. McGrath. I'm willing to make a motion that um, the access is a right in, right out off of Lowell Road only, and that the, would you call it a median, the, the little triangle, triangle. area? Triangle. I'm Delta, sorry, Delta, 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 Delta Island, Island that it, it, it elongated in a way to discourage left-hand turns. Okay. That's a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Owen. Any discussion? Uh, just a comment. Okay. Um, first of all, because of I've said it before, I've witnessed over the number of years that I've been doing this that. Um, it's difficult uh, to try and prohibit left-hand turns into a site or left-hand turns out, but the more that we can do to, to prevent that, the better. And this is a recommendation, uh, there was a list of recommendations, and this was the most preferred method. Okay. Mr. Collins, you had your hand up? Uh, yeah, I, I don't favor this motion. I, I, I kind of think that that intersection should be thoroughly vetted and looked at and <clears throat> restricting it and uh, uh, shaping it to deter left-hand turn lanes. Left-hand turns into the development, in my eyes, will cause a safety concern along the road, especially for southbound coming traffic when people are trying to cut through uh, or make an abrupt left turn into the site. They're going to do it. So. That, that's my opinion. Can I? Is a motion? Well, I'd like to respond yeah. to this, the concern. Hmm? The other thing I'd like to point out is that left turning traffic would be northbound, right? Yes. And typically they'd be coming from you know, northbound. You're coming from the south. They would, in the evening, when low road is all jammed up, it's, a grid, it's gridlock. Coming home from work, the, I, I think the, per, the, per, the behavior would be to turn left at Executive Drive rather than sit in the gridlock on Mole Road. I, I, so I think that would curtail some mm -hmm. of it. The other aspect I would point out um, in support of the right in, right out is that um, for this development, mm -hmm. it's a captive audience, I'd say. The residents, they're signing a lease. Um, there's I live in an apartment building right now mm -hmm. um, with a right in, right out entrance. And in order to make a left turn, I have to go out a little out of my way to a traffic light. And it's explained to you when you move in. So I, I think it's different than if it were to be, say, a shopping center where um, everybody is more of a free for all. So. Mr. Collins. I don't want to go back and forth on this. Uh, I appreciate your, your input on that, but where you live, uh, if you took a left-hand turn out of your development off of that right in, right out, you'd be coming on the wrong side of the bridge. Yes. Right. So in this instance, you have two travel lanes, one heading north, one heading south, with a medium or a turning lane in the middle. And <clears throat> I believe that the intersection there uh, can be configured in a way that would allow that left-hand turn lane in, and it would be done in a safe manner. Uh, because 90% of the traffic in the evening is heading north, uh, more so than south. Uh, I'm not against the right-hand turn in, right-hand turn out. I am, I'm against configuring it in such a way that it, it promotes an unsafe movement from Wall Road. So I agree, people will take a left-hand turn on executive drive to access the point, but there's always that one or two, or maybe three or four people that will not do that. 
So configuring, configuring with longer islands and more prohibitive movements, in my eyes, is going to cause a problem. I'm not, like I said, I'm not against a right hand turn and right hand turn out. Uh, it doesn't always work, mm -hmm. but it can be effective depending on the businesses. Now, Irving is used, and, and <clears throat> that is a business. Uh, this is a residence. People will be coming from and to that residence more often than people turn into Irving. Yeah, for the most part. I've, I've seen Irving uh, where there's nobody there. <clears throat> Traffic numbers are... Right. I, 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 that's a bad assumption. But anyway, uh, I think people will try to, to make that left-hand turn into there from Law Road <clears throat> on occasions. And if you're going to configure that intersection or, uh, for a right-in, right-out only, it should be done in a, in, a, in a deliberative way that allows people to break the law, we'll call it, <coughs> safely. So. Yeah. No. Mr. Manry. I, I just have a question. On the, the 50 foot uh, right away for Friar Drive, it gets a lot wider on page sheet nine, the one I'm happy to be looking at. As you get closer to Wall Road, does that mean that that right away is, is wider as we get meet up with the Wall Road? actually easement, okay. yes. Right. And it does mean that. And so that's, in, that's the future, if, staff, in the no future, if that road needed to be shifted around a little bit, like if we had to put a lighted intersection in there at some point, we would have the flexibility to do that. That's, yes, that's the reason for it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other further comments? Questions? Okay, so the motion on the table is for right turn in, right turn out with them elongating the delta. delta. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a delta anymore. Well, there won't be a delta. <laughs> It'll be west. Does, does this include a slip lane? The motion did not include a slip lane. Yeah. So, but that's the discussion that is needed at this point. I can add that because I don't have I don't have an objection to that. If that's the prevailing thought of the board, I don't mind adding that to my motion. As a seconder, I would uh, wonder, we had this discussion as to whether or not the slip lane would be advantageous at this point, and or would it become part of um, upcoming low road developments at a future time, depending upon the traffic that's in there. And I think maybe the slip lane should be delayed until that time and the developer is aware of the fact that that may take place and has already given some land to the town for that uh, potentiality. So Then I won't add it to my motion. Okay. Any other comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nays? Just so one nay? No one nay. Mr. Collins, in opposition? Motion carries. All right, so I guess the next big bugaboo that would be parking. They're probably going to want to have an answer on parking. So I would say at this point we can't give them an answer on the exception because we don't have the mechanism, right? I, I mean, I, in my opinion, I think it would be better to have the applicant um, propose a different mechanism to what that trigger is to for 2.0, unless the board doesn't like that idea altogether. Um, I think it's a flexible and a reasonable one because it gives the board the, the ability to require the 2.0. Mr. Chairman, if no one makes a motion for the waiver, then there's no discussion, correct? The request has been asked. I believe we do have to make some sort of action on it. Somebody has to make a motion for the waiver. Well, it, it these, has to be either... At some point during, does not the public, in, in, in the scope of this public meeting and public review, which can last over several public meetings, that the waivers do have to be addressed. Yes. I'll make a motion to defer discussion on waiver number uh, concerning the parking till the next regular planning board meeting. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> Mr. Vanderbeek, in seconds. Are we just deferring the waivers now, or, or is everything going to be discussed all over again at that meeting? Can, can I make a point of order, Mr. Absolutely. Chairman? 
I'm having a real difficult time hearing both of the two gentlemen at the end of the, the table. And I, if I'm having a hard time, people that are watching this are having a hard time. So if you could. Pull your mic's a little closer. Yeah. Thank you. Are we, are we deferring the entire thing until next week, or are we just deferring the, the waivers? Or until the next meeting, I call this. This motion was just concerning the waiver concerning parking. Right. Because we're talking about waivers at the moment. Which technically, I guess, we don't need a motion to defer the waiver. It was made. Well, but it was made and seconded, so. Any discussion? Uh, that Just was comments. Mr. Vanderbeek in that second? It was, okay. yeah. All in favor of deferring the waiver to the next meeting, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. To an opposition, Mr. Veloso and Mr. Dillon. Yeah. Mr. Dumont. Mr. Dillon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, procedurally, could we get their uh, uh, reasons for the reason? Sure. Yeah. Mr. Veloso. I, I, I think my opposition is more, I don't think procedurally you need it. If the matter is going to be continued, then you don't need to defer a particular section of the hearing because the public hearing is just going to continue on. So all matters that have not been addressed continue with the, the proceeding. So my position is more just procedural than anything. I don't think a motion is required at this point. I agree. <clears throat> Mr. Dumont agrees. All right. It's too late. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> does, does anybody want to address the existing conditions waiver? You know, I, I, I think that this one is actually appropriate and can be um, decided upon tonight. So the waiver is looking at, so our, our regs look at our, looking at our existing condition plans, plan requirements. <clears throat> Number 15 says location of all buildings within 50 feet of the track. 16 says location of all travelways and driveways within 200 feet of the track. Then se section so, uh, 17, talking about existing topography, uh, specifically states that for the portion of the track being proposed for development, not the entire track. Um, so therefore, the waiver is not needed for number 17. So it really concerns 15 and 16. So then what does that mean? Just the buildings and the driveways within a certain distance of the boundary lines. Um, <coughs> I think it's it's a it's a burden that doesn't really provide a benefit to the board. Uh, I just didn't doing some crude measurements um, earlier. Strict adherence to this would require them to show driveways and buildings almost uh, half a mile away from this development. So it. The intent of the regulation is to show the context of the development being proposed, right? Um, and, and, and that's why regulations have flexibility and, and have waivers. So where it makes sense, it's appropriate. Mr. Dorr. I'd like to make a motion move to grant the request of waiver subsequent uh, request of waiver of 276-11.1 subsequent 15 and 16 to allow for the existing condition survey to pertain only to the portion of the parcel being developed based on the board's discussion as recorded in the meeting minutes and the testimony of the applicant's representative and in accordance with the language included in the submitted waiver request form. I'll second that. Mr. Veloso seconds. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? The ayes have it. I think of the last one we touch. <clears throat> Roadway one, um, yeah, I, I made the recommendation that uh, it's a waiver that might be appropriate to approve next, the next meeting right. or, or whatever that might be. Um, right now, um, we're still sort of working out those details as uh, from what the applicant has provided us in terms of revisions. Uh, and then in terms of town staff review and as, as well as legal review. So I think this is something that, that can work eventually, um, but right now I'd rather, uh, I'd rather the board address it um, at a later time. Later, yeah. Okay. So at this time I'll ask the applicant, is there anything else that, for direction that we need help 
No, I appreciate the question because I, I wonder, um, so I understand that the uh, parking issue has been postponed. Is there additional information that you would like? I, I think uh, one of the public comments was, uh, it had asked if studies have been done of the other Dakota partner properties and the parking counts and, and uh, mechanics of that. So maybe additional information to that regard. Maybe it's, is it possible to get those communities, are those in New Hampshire? Those Some of them are, yeah. Some of them. Maybe you gotta reach out to one of the code enforcement, see if they've had actually complaints listed against those, those properties. As a, as a record. Mr. always asked if we get, if, if, he could get, if we get the list of where those properties are. So that they sure. could actually do a drive-by, maybe if they wish to. Absolutely. Yeah. Some of them aren't in New Hampshire, but there are some in New Hampshire. <laughs> Anything in Mass you can keep? No. <laughs> um, Mr. Veloso, I'm just offering it out. Something that might also be useful is um, if there's any analysis or if there's any underpinning to the data that for. Uh, I understand for these single bedroom units that 1.5 cars is is either more amenable than two cars. And the reason I bring this up is that if the logic is that there's one person per one bedroom unit, um, is there any data or analysis taking into account situations where, let's say, one person becomes two people, a couple, and then you transition to a potential family and, and things like that? Is the and same thing with visitor, visitors and things like that. Is in the analysis of the 1.5 car per one bedroom unit, is there any data uh, supporting that analysis or does it take into account the possibility that more people can come in into this one bedroom unit than just one person? I, I'm just curious if, there, if there's any data discussing that, I, I'd, I'd be interested in the analysis. Mr. Collins? Um, okay. Uh, in prior cases, we've looked at this issue, and in my own belief, uh, you have the equipment on site, you're paving parking lots anyway at that point, and it would be cheaper overall to add those spaces initially than it would be later on for the, for the applicant. And uh, at this point, I would have voted for the waiver to allow it, but I think it just makes sense to, to have that done now put them in get it done and it, because you know last year's winter storms were very mild compared to prior years uh, parking becomes very small very quickly even though you're going to truck stuff off site there's still you know during peak pots of storms uh, there's nowhere for people to go or park their cars i mean it just becomes a little more difficult uh, and again we, we've looked at some other uh, or we've had other applicants come before the board where they wanted to defer the parking, but it just made more sense to just to do it now, get it done. So. I don't disagree with you in respect to when the equipment's out there, pave it now, get it done. Uh, the way we look at it, and we've looked at it for our projects from here to Virginia, mm -hmm. in the studies and the places we had it, we see that it's not necessary to have that, that two, per, two per unit. Uh, and what we proposed here was the first phase, we go in at 1.5, and we realize both ourselves and the town realizes that it's just not adequate because of the nature of this area. Then the second phase, we will incorporate that spaces in there because we'll be, like you said, we'll have the equipment on site anyways, and we'll be building out that second phase. Uh, we have it completely designed already, mm -hmm. already for drainage and everything else for that additional spaces if, if it's need be. So I don't disagree with what you're saying at all in that respect. All right. You're not going to put the drainage in ahead of time or you'd have to tie it all in later on? It's, it's all designed right now for it. And so when we do the second phase and we, and we find from the town saying that it's, you need it because we are getting complex you know, complaints, and we're getting complaints because we're going to hear it as well. Mm -hmm. Come the second phase, we'll put it in. Mm -hmm. If we're not getting any complaints and it's not necessary, 
both from the idea of the snow, because we do have areas that are, the snow is being outside of the spaces, mm -hmm. that it's not a problem, and we find it's not a problem, because, again, we've done it in multiple locations, then it's not necessary for the second phase, it would be our opinion. But that will be a joint decision between us and the town to make that call. And at that, if it is necessary, it's already been completely designed, and it's ready to go. We don't need to go and redesign it. Okay. So. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've already deferred the discussion of the parking until the next meeting. And if the uh, uh, applicant were to come forward with a revised waiver to say that he was going to do this in phases, I think that may be to his benefit. But that's up to the applicant to make the waiver in, in the, the right terminology. For a default, would anybody like to make that motion? I'll make the motion, but I have a couple of questions Continue before they part. before they depart. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, two questions. In your presentation, Jay, you mentioned about uh, vetting of the applicants for the the housing. Is that for all? all residents of that apartment or is it just for the primary uh, is it just for the workforce it's housing? just for the restricted income yeah, ones. For the restricted in the sense because you, you mentioned certain criteria that um, of, of the background check that you would do a couple of them really kind of you know makes you perk up a little bit and pay more attention. So that's So there's that's sort of two answers, two parts to the answer. Uh, as a practical matter, we do it, but we're required to do it um, kind of in the audit sense to demonstrate restricted income qualification. Now that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the, I mean, although the income is important, but I'm talking about the personal information. Right. Uh, whether it's criminal or other, that the background checks that you do, and does that does that encompass all of the residents? And as, if not, as a why practical not? matter, and yes. And if not, why not? It, as a practical matter, it does. It's not a requirement of anything, but we do it because this is the management company that's managing the site for us, and they do it. So, and so they do it for everybody. So it would be for all residents? It, as practically. Other, speaking, other than minor is, children? Right. Yeah, okay. And then the other question that I have is recreational space and whether or not that's going to include swimming pools, play sets, uh, playground, playground there's a, play, area. There's a clubhouse and a playground, no swimming pool. No swimming pool? No. Okay. Uh, you're showing a community garden as well? Yeah. yeah. Community garden as well. Yeah. That's going to be, okay. By the way, if there's a full plan set that's available, I'd like to get a copy of that because I'm having real difficulty reading yeah. this. Um, can the applicant provide uh, revised full-size plan sets for the sure. board members? Thank you. How many sets? I'm good. Say uh, seven. Seven? Full seven? Well, no. raise your hand if you do want one. Two or three. Two or three. Uh, I'll say I can kill trees. <laughs> <laughs> no. At I'm least not, one. I'm not in favor of killing trees, but by the same token, I really do want to see what you're proposing. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is, like, oh. really difficult. Uh, another thing that does need to be addressed that Chairman Malley just pointed out to me, um, he and I went through the plans together and noticed a number of errors in the um, the notes on sheet two, which is mostly, well, it's all notes. There's a few errors. And then if you, if you go down the plans, like sheet nine, note 14 has an error, and you know, it's just a mathematical error. Minor things like that to clean that up. And also on sheet two, um, I think initially they, uh, the requested waivers and the waivered items have been listed or embedded within these notes. Whereas in Hudson, we like to see the uh, waiver list in uh, its own. Yeah, thank you. Question, Mr. Randy. 
Okay, this is a question on the roadway requirements waiver, or just the roadway, Friars Drive in particular. At what point is it part of this site plan or is it part of the next site plan for the back 90 acres or whatever it is <laughs> um, for the full build out? When do we when do we uh, review so, so that? So when do we see the full build out of the road? Yeah, when do we uh, vote on that? That would be portion. when the back portion gets developed, depending on what they're okay. utilizing it for. So, so this site plan is only to approve that 50 foot right away and and the the bed the road bed right, Mr. Demas. The 24 feet. Uh, yes. So uh, to rebuild the road bed to town standards and have the 24 foot road. So we just have to the shoulders. Yep. Okay. The existing will remain the same and the will continue with the grade. Okay. So the full build out, we don't really need to worry about at this stage of the game because it'll be another site plan. It'll be a site plan condition for that. For, for that. Okay. Thank you. Somebody else goes to pay for it. It'll all be done. Okay. Just, I just would like to make one final comment because I think that we're in a position where we can defer this to the next meeting. But um, the architectural renderings that were shown tonight, I think, are certainly not in keeping with the character of this town and what what the residents would want to see. I've been a lifelong resident, and it's disappointing to me that. You'd propose a development that looks like it belongs in downtown Nashua, or the <clears throat> development that's on East Hollis Street. This isn't keep in keeping with the character of this town. And I would like to suggest to you that you take a look and revisit that, because the way it's conditioned now, I won't be voting in favor of it. Is there any way to provide them a little more clarity? I gave them clarity at the last meeting. They didn't take it. It was a shopping center. Well, it's, it's the architectural design of that shopping center that is in keeping. And all you need to do is take a look around. So I appreciate you where you're coming from, but what they did was look at that shopping center, and I have a list of things that they incorporated into the design. Uh, at the direct result of your comment. So for instance, there's a low-pitched gabled roof, asphalt shingles with pro pronounced roof vents, the, the colors, um, the entry, the whole idea of separating and making a large building look smaller by uh, segments, if you will. So we're trying to accommodate uh, your concerns. I, you know, I hear you. Um, I, I don't agree with you, but I hear you, and it's a, it's a hard, it's not a simple task. So I, I also appreciate the chair's comment on, you know, I'm not sure we know what you would like to see, assuming that the starting position is a building that has 47 residential units in it, half one bedroom and half two. You know, I, I guess I don't know where to go from there. We've, we've made it look smaller and feel smaller, both from outside and inside. I'll do some research and provide some photographs for you. But, I, but I, with all due respect, I also have to say that part of that decision um, is the property owners and the applicants, and they need to be able to build a building that functions for their purposes, too. So. You know, we, we get to balance some of that. But I, I, you know, I appreciate where you're coming from, uh, and I know everybody has heard you. This, in that regard, does that, do other members have comments? I mean, uh, is there a strong feeling that this is not a, um, a workable start? <laughs> I'm glad it's green building. I, I thought that was terrific, but, uh, you know, obviously, I missed the boat a little bit. I, I don't have any problem personally. No, it's, it's a, it's a, personally, it's a, it's a peaked New England looking building. Granted, it's an apartment building, so it's going to have different dimensions than a house. Yeah, but yeah. It's not a Manchester triple decker, that's for sure. No. 
but it's got it's got peaks, and that's a traditional New England look, and it's got clapboard siding. I can't I can't hear one word. So oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, in my viewpoint, it's got peaked roofs. It has clapboard siding. It has uh, shingles shingled roof, and while it is larger than most houses, it does have a lot of the New England architectural features. My opinion. Mr. Chairman, are we ready to defer? One quick second. I forgot to read into the record a uh, email that was received during the public input call, and I would like to get it on the record at this point. It's from Kevin Lynch at uh, 733 Fox Hollow Drive. Um, I'm just going to read it as it says, I guess. Um, Hello, I am unable to attend this week's meeting regarding the Hudson Crossing Apartments. I don't know if this would is within protocol, but was hoping someone could voice my objection as to how we could possibly entertain constructing not only a visually unattractive building, looks like a dormitory, but also the possibility of adding upwards to 200 more cars on the road that cannot support what is there now. Sincerely, Kevin Lynch, 733 Fox Hall Drive. So with that, Motion to defer. Okay, so we will defer to date specific June 26, 2019. We have a motion. Second. Second. Second, Mr. Miller. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension. Motion carries. Thank you, Thank you very much. Minutes. Yes, no problem. How about if. I think I know Mr. Chairman, I would move that we accept the minutes of May 8th. Folks, could you quiet down? We're still on the air. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we accept the minutes of the May 8th business meeting. I'll second that. We have a second by Mr. Veloso. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Mr. Chairman, I move we accept the minutes of the uh, May 22nd uh, meeting. I'll second that. Mr. Veloso seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? So, uh, second. I'll second. I'll I'm sorry. Uh, that's all right. Second by Mr. Veloso. All in favor say aye. Aye. The planning board meeting is now adjourned at 9.58. Go Bruins.